Hello, fellow misfits. This week we'll present a horrifying, true, scary stories that unfold in the great outdoors, where Bigfoot, Wendigos, and Dogmen roam. Our courageous park rangers, campers, hunters, and police officers are about to discover the chilling truth lurking within the darkness. Are you ready to join them? As always, thank you for your support. Let's get that 20,000 subscribers. And now, Story Time. My name is Frank K and I've always been a skeptic when it comes to anything unexplained. That was until I was taken to a site where a hunter was charged by a creature he claimed to be a seven and a half foot Bigfoot. This experience has left me questioning everything I thought I knew. It all started when my friend, a fellow hunter, called me up and insisted that I come with him to the location where he had experienced something terrifying. He said that he had shot a buck, but before he could even approach it, a massive creature emerged from the woods and charged at him. He barely managed to escape, and he wanted me to see the evidence for myself. I agreed to go with him, mostly out of curiosity and the assumption that he must have been exaggerating or mistaken about what he saw. We packed our gear and headed out to the site. As we arrived, I noticed a strange tension in the air, a feeling I couldn't quite put my finger on. My friend led me to the spot where he had shot the buck, and what I saw there left me speechless. The deer was mutilated, its body broken in ways that seemed unnatural and brutal. Nearby, there were broken trees and tracks that didn't resemble any animal I had ever seen. To top it off, the deer carcass was partially covered with sticks, as if someone or something had tried to hide it. My friend, visibly shaken, recounted his experience with the creature. He said it looked like a mix between a man and a dog, with massive, hulking limbs and a snarling, canine-like face. He called it a dogman, a term I had never heard before. I couldn't believe what I was hearing, but the evidence in front of me was hard to ignore. As we investigated the site further, we noticed a pungent, musky smell in the air. It was then that we heard a low growl, echoing through the woods. My friend and I exchanged worried glances, suddenly aware that we were not alone. We decided it was best to leave the area immediately, not wanting to risk another encounter with the dogman. That day changed everything for me. I've spent countless hours researching dogman sightings and encounters since then, trying to understand what we experienced. It was an early Saturday morning, and I found myself at the Malala River campsite, about 20 miles south of Malala, Oregon. I was there with a group of friends from the local TV station, filming a piece on the great outdoors and the beauty of the Pacific Northwest. Little did I know that our tranquil weekend getaway would soon turn into a harrowing experience that none of us would ever forget. We had spent the day hiking, fishing, and enjoying the scenic beauty of the area. As the sun began to set, we gathered around the campfire, sharing stories and laughter late into the night. Eventually, one by one, we retreated to our tents, exhausted from a long day of adventure. I awoke suddenly around 3 or 4 in the morning, disoriented and unsure of what had roused me from my slumber. That's when I heard it, a low, guttural growling sound that seemed to come from just outside my tent. I lay there, frozen in fear, my heart pounding in my chest as I tried to make sense of the noise. Then I heard the screams. I scrambled out of my sleeping bag and rushed outside, only to see that the tent belonging to some of my TV crew friends was being violently shaken by an unseen force. The growling grew louder, and I could hear the terror in my friends' voices as they cried out for help. Gathering my courage, I picked up a nearby flashlight and shone it towards the tent. The shaking stopped abruptly, and I caught a glimpse of a large, dark figure retreating into the shadows of the forest. The growling faded away, leaving an eerie silence in its wake. My friends emerged from their tent, visibly shaken and pale. They told me that they had been awoken by the growling and had felt something powerful and menacing pressing against their tent, as if trying to get inside. We couldn't determine what had attacked them, 
But we knew we needed to leave the campsite immediately. As the first light of dawn broke through the darkness, we hastily packed our belongings and made our way back to civilization. I worked as a ranger in Northern Carolina for well over 20 years. I've had my fair share of weird happenings and some gruesome ones too. I found multiple dead bodies during my time working there. All of the killers were luckily brought to justice by the police. But it's not the killings that got me to quit my job and never come back. It was something a little more unexplainable. Something so weird, in fact, that I sometimes still wonder if it was all just a dream or vision or indeed a real event. I'll tell you exactly what I saw from the beginning. It was the middle of August, and the sun was scorching the ground with its rays. Not many people visited during the day for obvious reasons. I hated when I had to leave my guard hut to make a tour of the park. That would usually include a lot of sweating and feeling like somebody is roasting you in a pan. I was already pretty beat during my first two hours, drinking more than enough water to try and keep hydrated. As it was already time to go out for the third and final tour of the day, because for the next shift another ranger was going to replace me, I went on a walk. About halfway through, I started feeling dizzy and a little lost. I felt weaker and weaker up until I could not stand anymore. I sat under a nearby tree to try and get some rest and regain strength, but the sun and heat were too strong. I began seeing things and just felt a little too real. The tall shadowy figures began emerging from behind trees, walking slowly and aimlessly. I couldn't move or breathe properly, so I just sat there staring back at them. In a minute, there were so many of them, I lost count, and more began emerging straight from the ground. I was confident that I had had a severe sunstroke. They didn't seem to pay any attention to me at first. They just wandered around and let out horrific screams of pain, like somebody being cooked alive. Just then, one of those figures had noticed me, slowly making its way. It was over eight feet tall, so it had to crouch down to get close to me. I was petrified, but I didn't possess the strength to do anything. The figure didn't stop screaming for a split second either. It just crouched next to me and put its hand on my cheek. I started to burn. I lost consciousness. Other rangers found me passed out on the ground about an hour later, getting me to an ambulance. I was relieved for a minute, but when I got up from the bed, I saw that red burning handprint. It terrified me so much I had to resign. None of my bosses or colleagues ever believed me. I guess I can't say I blame them. I saw what I believe was a Sasquatch about five years ago. I was 16 years of age. I was volunteering as a counselor at a day camp. A friend and I went for a walk on the trails within the camp. We were cleaning trails and we also brought our lunches which we planned to eat later. We were on the outskirts of camp maybe half mile from main camp, very close to the Malala River. I was about 60 feet from a muddy creek, kind of a swampy area. I remember sitting down to eat lunch and my friend realized that he had left something back at camp that he needed. I can't remember what he went to get, maybe a tool or something to drink. So he left and I remained seated on a log waiting for him to come back. I expected the jog to take maybe 10 minutes. He had been gone for at least seven minutes when I heard something in the woods to my left. I stood up to get a better look at what it was. What I observed was a massive hairy man-like animal standing next to a large tree, I think it was a cedar. It was about 50 feet away. I estimate that it was about 8 feet tall. I stood about 5 feet 9 inches at that time and it was far taller than me. It was also very wide and bulky looking. The fur was thick and fairly long, maybe six inches, and medium brown in color. It looked directly at me for a few seconds. We had solid eye contact. It had dark colored eyes. It seemed to be shocked or surprised and was deciding what to do. It stepped to its right, my left, behind the large tree and immediately began to run away. I could not see it run away because the tree blocked my view, but I definitely heard it. It sounded very heavy, 
The footsteps could be heard clearly. It was snapping down branches as it ran, creating a lot of noise. It sounded very powerful. I listened to it run away for maybe 10 seconds and then I turned around and ran back on the trail towards camp. I met up with my friend on his way back to meet me. I've always been an avid mushroom picker, roaming the woodlands of southeast Poland in search of edible treasures hidden among the undergrowth. One autumn day, I set out on my usual mushroom picking expedition, hoping to return home with a bountiful harvest. As I wandered deeper into the forest, I stumbled upon something utterly bizarre, a concrete staircase that seemed to lead to nowhere. It was as if it should have led to a building that wasn't there. or perhaps a very tall plane curiosity peaked i decided to investigate further as i approached the staircase i noticed that everything within a 100 meter radius was rotten and dead the air carried a peculiar soapy smell that i couldn't quite place when i stepped closer the ground beneath my boots gave in and bubbled as if reacting to my presence feeling unnerved i quickly decided to leave this strange place behind I hurried back home, washed myself thoroughly, and disposed of my clothes and boots. However, in the days that followed, I developed a nasty cough and a painful rash that seemed to spread across my body. Concerned, I visited the doctor, who ran a series of tests on me. Eventually, he concluded that my symptoms were caused by irritation from a strongly basic substance, similar to lye. The diagnosis left me with more questions than answers. To this day, I still wonder what that mysterious staircase was doing in the middle of the woods. Could it have been the remnants of an old soap factory or warehouse? And if so, why was it located in such a remote and desolate place? Despite my efforts to uncover the truth, the enigma of the concrete staircase remains one of the strangest and most unsettling experiences of my life. My dad worked as a cop in a small town here in Montana. Nothing really out of the ordinary, just burglars and kids playing pranks, domestic violence stuff. Yeah, that was ordinary for him. As my siblings and I grew older, we learned some pretty unnerving stuff about people and our neighbors. Some people are just evil, no justification is necessary. My father is a very no-nonsense kind of man. He's also an atheist and very skeptical about things like the paranormal, especially considering most of the crap he's had to deal with involved real-life humans or animals. But there is one situation he never got cleared up. There are lots of abandoned houses where we grew up. My town definitely saw better times in the past. There were some pretty elegant buildings left to decay. Kids would play there, urban exploration. and there were a few emergencies concerning drug dealers and gangs mostly calls from scared neighbors or people who saw weird stuff one night and my father is sent with a partner towards an abandoned place because a kid and an elderly woman saw a witch man dancing to a fire in the backyard apparently he thought it was either a druggy or some sort of gang activity it had to go The worst is that they can only find it would be local kids lighting up a bonfire and they'd have to stop them and make them toss out the fire before things got out of control. So, they met a bunch of neighbors complaining about the noise and lights and everybody kept talking about the witch man. My father's companion says he saw somebody moving on the floor above, so they got to the house, announced themselves, and just get inside because naturally, nobody answered. Once inside, they say the prank was successful and fun, but that it's time to stop. The neighbors have had enough. They start to register the place, a room for room, and they only see old stuff but really nothing of value. It must have been stolen. Same for the second floor, but there, and my father begins feeling tense, and so does his partner, like they were being watched. But they saw nobody, and it's not like there were many places left to hide. Really. In the end, both my father and his partner saw something shiny outside, orange light of fire. But when they looked at the window, they saw nobody there. They talked to the police station via the radio, 
hearing more complaints about the noise but nothing else. Both walk around the garden and saw nothing, and that's what they told the worried neighbors. It was not until they reached the station that they saw the people they were giving them odd looks. A lady from admin later showed them an audio recording. In it, you could hear my father and his colleague describing what he saw on the neighbor's complaints, yelling noises in the background from an angry man with a very deep raspy voice. The noises were slushed and weird, but it said something like get out, this is my place. They received a few more emergency calls, nobody ever found anything really relevant. To this day, my father, who I repeat is still a firm non-believer, still feels rather creeped out when he remembers that event. I live in Australia and as a teenager of about 13 or 14. Being a person from underprivileged and mostly neglected background and my escape at time was to disappear into the bush on my own. Very often for a few days at a time. I was in an area that was off limits to people as it formed part of a very large water catchment. I had no fear of being out there on my own, and my biggest concern was being caught by a waterboard ranger or running into other people. This was back in the 80s with no mobile phones or GPS available. I had camped out for the night on a hill that I had stayed at many times before, and I knew the lay of the land well. And come the morning I decided to head back to the road that was about 5 kilometers away via a ridgeline. It was very rare to come across other people out here, but this morning, I could hear people talking in the distance in the direction I had to travel. I felt that I really needed to avoid these people discovering I was out there in this very isolated place. So I decided to go around them by walking down into a valley, and to follow the bottom of the valley for some distance, and then make my way back uphill to the ridge behind them. I had reached the bottom of the valley and walking along very quietly watching where I stepped not breaking any branches or snapping twigs as the sound would travel a long way. I often would startle wildlife when I walked out in these areas, and was quite used to seeing a kangaroo or wallaby suddenly spring up out of nowhere, and bound up to a safer distance away from me. And that is what I expected from this kangaroo that had just stood up about 15 meters in front of me except it didn't bound away it just looked at me. I was looking back at it I realized this kangaroo was much larger than the ones I would normally come across, and he had a number of mates with him maybe 8 or 9 of them all within about 50 meters of me, and they were not going anywhere. They stood up tall, and looked right at me, and were about twice my size and very muscled up. I stood where I was for about 5 minutes with them looking at me, and me looking right back we were at a standoff. I was considering walking through this group but by this stage I had started to get quite intimidated by their total lack of fear of me, and their sheer size. I decided my best option was to back out the way I had come feeling more confident they would just go back to their grazing once I was out of sight so that is what I did. This was a very unsettling experience for me to be intimidated by something I expected would avoid me, but due to the isolation of this place I don't think they had ever come across people before, so they didn't have the fear of man that most others would have. After that I never went back into the catchment area knowing there was a big mob in there, and I was more afraid of them than they were of me. It started happening at the end of July over a span of a month or so. My, then 23 months old, daughter sleeps in an office turned nursery connected to my room. It is small in size with one window, and is relatively dark, due to a blackout shade. One can make out most detail once eyes adjust. Meaning the corners are dark, but not pitch black. I was standing beside her crib as is routine singing a lullaby and rocking her, she was looking around the room and at me, when suddenly her eyes find the corner to the left of the window. Immediately she gets a big grin and starts to wave. Of course I look in the direction she was waving, but see nothing, decide that it's toddler antics, kiss her and put her to bed. A few days or a week goes by with nothing. Then during nap time one day, same thing, same corner. She's looking around the room, I'm rocking her gently, her eyes fall upon the corner and she starts to smile again and wave. I say, 
What are you waving at? She doesn't say anything about it. This happened a few more times always at naps or bedtime and always the same corner. Never seemed scared. So I decided it had to do with a shadow or something in that corner, blank wall, but whatever. Well, few days later, same routine, holding her and singing a lullaby, it had happened with enough frequency that I am starting to anticipate, when her eyes fall on a different place in the room, and she starts to smile and wave. I got chill bumps immediately. I asked her what she was waving to, what did she see, and got nothing kissed her and put her down. We left to go out of town the next day for a week. Another dark room, same routine, nothing. No waves, no smiles, normal bedtime. When we got back the house, I had put all of it to the back of my mind while unpacking etc. Bedtime, book, start to sing her a lullaby and rock her while she sleepily looks around the room, when suddenly she picks her head up, starts waving happily in the direction of the original corner. This time as she's waving and smiling, she says bye bye. She has not waved since that night. I've always been intrigued by the unexplained, so when I heard about a series of strange sightings on a property just outside Estacada, Oregon, I knew I had to investigate. My name is Rip Little and I'm a journalist specializing in stories about the unknown and the mysterious. I got in touch with Stuart, a professional fish and game guide who was familiar with the area, to see if he could help me uncover the truth behind these strange occurrences. Stuart agreed to meet with me and share his story. He had been looking for a house to buy about five to six miles out of Estacada, on Porter Road. While visiting a potential property, the owners had casually mentioned that an unknown creature had been seen around the area about five times. Naturally, my curiosity was piqued. As we sat down over coffee, Stuart recounted the stories he had heard from the property owners. They described a tall, bipedal creature with dark fur, walking upright like a human but clearly not one. They said it had a distinctive, pungent odor and emitted unsettling sounds that seemed to reverberate through the forest. Stuart, being an experienced outdoorsman, was initially skeptical of the tales. He had spent countless hours in the wilderness and had never encountered anything remotely like the creature they described. However, he couldn't dismiss the sincerity in their voices, so he decided to look into the matter further. Over the following weeks, Stewart delved into local archives and spoke with longtime residents of the area. He discovered that reports of the creature went back decades, and many people in the community had their own stories to share. Some had seen it from afar, while others had experienced frighteningly close encounters. Despite the varying details, one thing remained consistent, the overwhelming sense of fear and unease that accompanied each sighting. As I listened to Stewart's account, I couldn't help but feel a shiver run down my spine. There was something about these stories that struck a chord deep within me, and I knew I had to see the location for myself. Together, Stuart and I ventured out to the property on Porter Road. We explored the surrounding woods, searching for any signs of the elusive creature. Though we didn't catch a glimpse of it that day, the heavy silence and eerie atmosphere of the forest left us both feeling uneasy. The stories of the unknown creature haunted my thoughts, and I couldn't help but wonder if it was truly out there, lurking in the shadows. As I continue to investigate, I can't help but be drawn deeper into the mystery. What could be behind these sightings? Is there a rational explanation, or is there something truly otherworldly at work? I may not have the answers yet, but I'm determined to keep searching until I uncover the truth. I was just out for a Sunday stroll in the near woods when I suddenly stood in front of something that looked like a single huge boar with terrifying tusk. Maybe 20 to 30 meters away and as I didn't have my glasses on it was a bit blurry. It was so tall and stood so still that I took it for some kind of fake or overstuffed taxidermy. I wondered why someone would place an oversized boar in our forest and walk towards in order to see if there were some hidden cameras or stuff like that. When I was 10 to 12 meters away the boar gave noise and I froze. 
For me it was surreal because that animal was definitely too big to be a wild boar in a small forest near a bigger town of Central Europe. I have seen big ones up to a shoulder high of nearly 1 meter but that thing was in another league standing 1.6 meters tall. Because it had a little bit high ground we were at eye level. I assumed a very elaborate prank and watched closely for hidden speakers, but was too afraid to move on. I finally found my glasses and put them one giving the prank bore an unsettling depth of detail. Then the bore moved in a way no servo or hidden wires could have done and I came to the slow realization that the giant a few meters away was indeed a hogzilla with tusks like daggers. There was only one time that my heart did the same reaction. And that was when I accidentally shocked myself with 230 VAC. It just stopped for a moment. With the adrenaline finally kicking and I got my heartbeat back and noped out in a firm and steady march frenetically littering everything in my backpack on the ground. I hoped that something would seem more interesting or eatable than me. I was too afraid to look back and walked on until I got to the next road where I stopped the next car. I got into the front passenger seat and told the friendly woman that it stopped for me to please please drive on. She was so kind to bring me to my parked car and the little parking space was full of cars and men. Turned out a prized Carpathian boar named Edgar was on the loose and this was the rescue party because the regional ranger had told the owner that he will shoot him, if he ever saw Edgar in his forest again. I told him where I had encountered Edgar and they got him with a tranquilizer gun while he was eating my lunch. Learned that day how big Carpathian boars can become and that Edgar was a nice guy most of the time and a little bit of a giant Houdini too. But dear god did that boar freak me out. And I cursed a bit that we sold the guns I inherited when we moved to the city. I actually lived in a haunted house for six years before and during high school. Turns out the lady who lived there before us was super weird and probably crazy, talking loudly to herself and claiming to see Indians in the backyard. My parents also found a sketchy circle of candles in the attic when we first moved in. My sister was sensitive to paranormal stuff and was the first to notice anything. She would see two little boys staring at her in her room in the middle of the night and a woman she guessed was their mother. There were apparently other spirits in the house but she saw them the most. She had a lot of shit happen to her. I didn't see anything except for once when I got up late at night to go to the bathroom and there was a purple floating orb in front of my door. I went back to bed and decided I didn't need to pee after all. I would also feel them touch me late at night. I would be playing on the computer with headphones, and sometimes my parents would come in and tap my shoulder to let me know I was going to bed. Only sometimes I'd feel someone grab my shoulder and nothing would be in my room because everyone else was asleep. After a while there started to be scratches on my shoulder and center of my back, where I can't reach. My sister actually reached out to taps from the TV show Ghost Hunters and they came out to investigate. That was super cool. It was a Friday, June 9th, when my daughter Diane and I joined my father Dan for some wood cutting on road 4661, southeast of Estacada, Oregon. The day started just like any other, with my father focused on his task and Diane and I working nearby. It was around 4 p.m. when Diane suddenly turned to me, her nose wrinkled in disgust. Do you smell that? She asked. I took a deep breath and was immediately hit by a potent, unpleasant odor. It was like a foul cloud that had passed through the area, lingering for just a few seconds before disappearing with the wind. I glanced at my father, who was about 50 feet away, but he didn't seem to notice anything. The smell reminded me of something I had heard about from Henry Franzoni and Pam Barrett near Skookum Lake. They had reported a similar odor when they believed they might have been near a Bigfoot. Diane and I exchanged glances, but we didn't see anything unusual. With no further evidence, we eventually dismissed the incident and continued with our work. However, little did we know that the strange encounter was far from over. Later that night, around 1 AM, the foul smell returned, even stronger than before. It was nauseating, like something dead or manure. 
Diane and I woke up to the sound of fur needles falling on the truck, but our dogs didn't react at all. They remained still, as if they were unaware of the overpowering stench that filled the air. We were 18 miles away from Ripplebrook Ranger Station and 32 miles from Detroit, Oregon. It was unlikely that the smell was coming from any human activity or farm animals. We couldn't shake off the feeling that we might have experienced a close encounter with a Bigfoot, even if we hadn't seen anything. The next day, Diane and I shared our story with my father, who seemed skeptical but intrigued by the possibility. We couldn't help but wonder if we had stumbled upon one of the most elusive creatures in the Pacific Northwest. Although we never saw any physical evidence of a Bigfoot that day, the mysterious odor and the feeling of being watched remained etched in our minds. It became a story we would share with friends and family, a testament to the unexplained mysteries that can be found in the dense forests of Oregon. As the years passed, Diane and I continued to explore the woods, always keeping an eye out for any sign of the elusive creature. And every time we caught a whiff of that unforgettable stench, we were reminded of that fateful day when we might have been closer to a Bigfoot than we ever thought possible. I'm an environmental field tech. I always find interesting things in the woods. Mostly abandoned places, trash, cars, and animal bones. One time I was on a job in Texas. We were deep in the woods, following our GPS. My team lead and I found piles and piles of beer cans. Almost little hills. We were almost tempted to start collecting them for cash but it would have taken all day and a full team. That wasn't the weird part though. As we moved past the beer can hills. We found a few little abandoned homemade shacks with wire fencing surrounding them and the largest amount of dog kennels I've ever seen. Some of them wood, some of them metal crates. Some stacked on top of each other. There was blood stains on a few of the wooden ones, which made me sick to my stomach. We didn't find any carcasses or any live animals. It was very obvious that this was not a normal kennel or backyard breeder. As an animal lover in my previous job was working at a dog kennel. It gave me a horrible feeling but apparently that's tame for what people find in my line of work. I've heard stories of people finding meth labs, traps to poppy fields, and even dead bodies in the marshes and wetlands that we survey. This happened nearly two years ago. I live Oklahoma, and I'm sure most of you have heard of the Bever family murders that took place in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma a few years ago. I would link a news article about it, but I'm too scared to even do that. Fall of 2016 was my first semester of college. I was an hour and a half away at college, and decided to come home for the weekend to see my ex and one of my friends. We loved going into abandoned places, and somehow the Bever house was brought up. It was definitely still talked about because it was so horrible. My friend knew where the house was, so we decided to drive by it. At this point, we had no intention of going in it. This was my second time ever seeing the house. We arrived and I parked my car at the end of the street. I had my camera with me, and I recorded the entire thing. First we went up to the house to just look in the windows. What really freaked me out was that the blinds were drawn and you could see into every room. There was a ceiling fan on in the kitchen, and a light on in one of the back bedrooms on the first floor. It got worse. We then noticed the floors were ripped up, the cabinets in the kitchen ripped out, and there were a ton of cutouts in the walls. Why? All of the blood. My ex decided to wiggle a door knob on a door that lead into the garage, and for some reason it was unlocked. All of the other doors to the house were locked and had those locked boxes on them like the house was for sale or something. So it was super weird that the door was just unlocked. When he opened it, he walked into the garage and went straight to the door to the house that lead into the kitchen. It was also unlocked. Like I said, I recorded the entire thing. I don't have it saved on my computer, but I did upload it to a YouTube channel and it's unlisted so that way I can send the link to people who are curious. If anyone would like that, just let me know. Once we got into the house, 
I felt very odd. It was so dark and heavy in there, for obvious reasons. We made our way through the kitchen and living room and eventually up the stairs. Along the way getting even more creeped out because of all of the little cutouts in the walls from the blood. Once we got upstairs, we noticed a door that was locked, but the light was on in the room. We were not able to open it. We eventually left, and then like the smart people we are, got two more friends with us and went back for a second time. The two people who came with us the second time were too scared to go in, so they waited in the driveway. That means that they were not able to see the door we entered or the kitchen at all because of the way the garage is placed. It protrudes from the house. The second time we went in, we just stayed in the kitchen, and my ex was talking out loud to the spirits. We heard footsteps upstairs. I caught a high-pitched scream in the video, and like I said, I'll link it if anyone wants. As soon as we walked out, the two friends in the driveway asked how it was and asked my friend that went in with me why she didn't respond to their text. She pulls out her phone and they had texted and asked if we were upstairs. Why? Because they saw someone standing in an upstairs window. Keep in mind, we only stayed in the kitchen. We sprinted to my car. The next day, I felt so weird. Long story short, I went to this spiritual bookstore and talked to the owner and he saged us. It was absolutely horrifying. One of my friends did not get saged, and she called us later that night and told us she was driving to the Bever house and didn't know why. Something was definitely attached to us. It was a chilly day in May when my two friends and I decided to embark on a camping trip at Skookum Lake. Located in the Cascades about 20 air miles southeast of Estacada, Oregon. We were looking forward to catching crawfish and enjoying the solitude of the remote location. The snow had made the roads almost impassable, but our four-wheel drive managed to get us through to our campsite. After setting up camp, we spent the day fishing and exploring the area. As night fell, we huddled around the campfire, swapping stories and enjoying each other's company. The peaceful silence of the wilderness was a welcome break from our daily lives. However, in the early hours of Monday, May 22, 1995, that peace was shattered. I began to hear the unmistakable sound of branches breaking in the distance. My curiosity peaked, I grabbed my powerful flashlight and shined it toward the source of the noise. About 150 feet away, I saw something I never expected to encounter, a Bigfoot. The creature was about seven feet tall, with glowing yellow eyes in the light. Its fur was black, but its head and shoulders were a much lighter color. The creature appeared to be sidestepping down a slope, and as I watched in awe, it froze in place. For 45 minutes, the Bigfoot stood there, not moving, even when I called my buddies over to witness the sight. They were just as astonished as I was, and we could hardly believe what we were seeing. Two days later, I returned to the area with plaster, hoping to find any evidence of the creature's presence. I discovered a partial track knot in the snow, measuring 21 inches in length. The large toe was clearly visible, and I carefully made a cast of the print. While searching the area, I also found two hand-sized droppings wrapped in a silky membrane. It appeared to be some sort of mold, and I collected the samples for further examination. Upon returning to our campsite, I noticed a large finger or toe print on my dark green 1977 Ford, right next to a small dent. I decided to lift the print using tape and flour, but not before asking a friend to take a close-up photograph of the evidence. With the track, droppings, and the print on my truck, I planned to bring everything to the local bookshop for examination. I hoped that these findings would help shed light on the elusive creature that had captivated our imaginations and left us with an unforgettable experience. I had a tenant living in basement, but he got into a car accident about three minutes walking from the house and passed away at the scene. At first I didn't know about this, but one night, I think it was no more than three days after the accident. The lights in our house were all flickered for exactly three times in a minute. But that's not all, 
I went to the bathroom later after my mom, the door wasn't locked. But as I was pushing the door, I felt a strong force behind the door pushing against me. At first I thought I hallucinated, but I tried for the second time and the door just didn't move. I pushed it really hard but it still didn't move. I think I even heard a chuckle, then I started talking with my mind saying whoever you are, we didn't do anything wrong, why are you messing with me, this is not funny. Then that force went away. After that I went on the internet, typed in his name then found out the accident. That was the only time the door jammed. In the 80s I was with two friends hiking in the Okefenokee Forest in Florida, basically a huge swamp with alligators, banana spiders, raccoons and miles of black mud and creeks and trees. The biggest spider webs I've ever seen everywhere with these huge yellow spiders, nearly walked into one. We were all tripping on acid when we found a long black wooden platform built in the middle of nowhere. It had weird symbols painted in white all over it. We stood on it looking around when about 50 raccoons silently walked out of the woods towards us, their little hands digging in the mud for food. They were not afraid of us, it was like that scene in Young Guns when they take mescaline and the Indians let them pass because they were in the spirit world. The raccoons surrounded up and passed by and under the platform. When they were gone we were like did you see that? I walked to the end of the platform and looked down. The symbols came together in perspective like an optical illusion to form the head of Baphomet. We decided to leave and go to the beach instead of waiting around to get sacrificed to the goat god. Two years ago, back in high school, my friends and I would go ghost hunting. Whenever we were bored and wanted to be out late, We'd drive around and try and scare ourselves with urban legends and creepy places. We never really found anything substantial, but we had a habit of driving along this old, two-lane road, Riverdale, where most of the ghost stories in our city stemmed. The road is long, narrow, and curvy, it stretches for about 20 miles north and south. Four of us were in the car that night, and as usual we managed to get a pretty good paranoia vibe going. We had never driven all the way south until the road ran out before, and we decided to do that then head home. It was almost 1 in the morning by the time we reached the end, and when we had turned around and began driving back, my friend driving, Vi, adjusted her rear view mirror and said, I think this car is following us. I thought she was just being paranoid and told her so, and that since the road was one lane either way they might just be going the same direction we were. She was convinced though, saying that the car was staying just far enough back that if she hadn't been paying attention she never would have noticed. We kept driving north, passing main exits, and the car stayed back far enough to see us but not extremely close. We turned east on a main road that was still several streets away from where I lived but eventually would lead there. Vi was still convinced the car was tailing us, and debated pulling into a Walmart parking lot but I advised against it because it was so late and there were only a few cars there. By now the rest of us were starting to get worried too, and Vi hooked a left and went south on a little used cross street that wasn't even paved. The car behind us, which we think was a dark blue Ford Ranger, followed us down this as well. Since we were doubling back on the way we came, we were all convinced she was right. We kept encouraging her to speed up, to try and evade them somehow but we were the only two cars on the road. At the next major intersection she hooked a right without signaling or being in the turn lane, but the car's headlights stayed behind us. We drove to the next intersection, going right and heading north, worried and unsure of what to do. We didn't want to call the police because we knew this car really hadn't done anything yet and our state had a curfew for people under 18. We knew we weren't going to drive to anyone's house though. And in a split-second decision we turned into a neighborhood, thinking that maybe whomever was in the car was just trying to scare some kids, and would leave once they assumed we went to our homes. To our relief, the car turned left, into an opposite neighborhood, and we all relaxed. Then, my friend in the back seat turned around, and noticed the car had flipped a U-turn and was waiting for us to turn the corner. They had turned their lights off. 
At this point the street curved and we lost sight of them. Vi sped up and, having watched drive like a week before, we turned into a cul-de-sac, parked in between two cars, and turned off the car. We sat in darkness and debated whether or not to call the police. We decided we should, and as I went to dial 911 we realized we had absolutely no idea what street we were on or what neighborhood we were in. After 10 minutes of doing nothing, we got up the courage to leave and try and drive to the nearest main road, where we wouldn't be blocked in or maybe there would be other cars. As we went to turn onto the street, the ranger turned the corner and stopped as we did. They had been waiting for us. Vi floored it, hoping to get pulled over or something, and we went 80 going out of there. We managed to head west on a main road and soon, when we had driven for minutes, speeding, we saw other cars and people. I don't know if that car followed us out of the neighborhood or not, or what the person or people inside planned to do. But they were willing to follow us to what could have been our houses, and I'm sure that if Vi had never noticed them then they would know where we lived. I've never seen that car again, but I'm always a little paranoid when I drive late at night by myself. Ever since I started studying the Bigfoot phenomenon four years ago, I've been fascinated by the countless theories and stories surrounding this elusive creature. One such theory that caught my attention was that Bigfoot was said to eat skunk cabbage, Lichitum americanum. In my fieldwork near Malala and Estacada, I examined several skunk cabbages, hoping to find some evidence that would support this theory. However, all I found were signs of insect consumption, nothing that would suggest Bigfoot or any other large animal had been feeding on the plants. Despite this setback, I remained determined to find evidence that could shed light on the eating habits of Bigfoot. Recently, my efforts seemed to have paid off when Frank Coniaster, the director of Bigfoot headquarters in Colton, Oregon, mailed me several photos that offered promising evidence. The photos, taken on June 14, 1995, near Malala, showed skunk cabbage leaf stalks that had been freshly broken off at the base and arranged across small six-inch logs, as if to be dried. Although the photos were dark, they were enough to rekindle my excitement about the possibility that Bigfoot might indeed be utilizing skunk cabbages as a food source. I couldn't help but wonder what other secrets these enigmatic creatures might be hiding and how much more there was to learn about them. With renewed enthusiasm, I decided to venture back into the field near Malala and Estacada to further investigate this intriguing development. As I carefully examined the area where the skunk cabbage stalks had been found, I realized that something had indeed been using these plants, but whether it was Bigfoot or some other animal, I couldn't be certain. However, the discovery of the broken and arranged skunk cabbage stalks had provided me with a new clue in my ongoing quest to unravel the mysteries surrounding Bigfoot. I was more determined than ever to continue my research and, hopefully, one day, find the definitive evidence that would prove the existence of these elusive creatures. As I walked through the dense forest, I couldn't help but feel a sense of awe and wonder at the thought that I might be sharing this space with a creature that had managed to elude human detection for centuries. It was a humbling reminder of how much we still have to learn about the natural world and the incredible mysteries that lie hidden within it. And as I continued my search, I knew that I was one step closer to uncovering the truth about Bigfoot and the enigmatic skunk cabbage connection. Growing up, I had always been a curious and imaginative child. I was about six or seven years old at the time, and like most kids, I would occasionally wake up in the middle of the night feeling scared or uneasy. This particular night was no different. I found myself wide awake, the darkness of my room feeling heavier than usual. Seeking comfort, I decided to head to my parents' room. Their door was shut, and for reasons I couldn't explain, I didn't dare open it. Instead, I sat down in the hallway on my beloved Garfield pillow, feeling a strange sense of unease in the dimly lit corridor. As I sat there, trying to make sense of my sudden fear, I saw something that sent chills down my spine. A figure emerged from the darkness, walking into the middle of the hallway. 
It was black darker than anything I had ever seen, as if it were made of an impossibly deep abyss. The figure was mostly humanoid, but its head was elongated, resembling the bird-like plague masks from centuries past. Frozen in terror, I watched as the figure stopped in the middle of the hall, and then, to my utter horror, turned to look directly at me. Its eyes were large, a haunting greenish-yellow color that seemed to pierce my very soul. The world around us seemed to stand still, the air thick with an almost tangible sense of dread. And then, just as suddenly as it had appeared, the figure was gone. The darkness of the hallway swallowed it whole, leaving me alone and trembling with fear. I bolted back to my bed and hid under the covers, hoping that whatever that thing was, it wouldn't return. To this day, I can still vividly recall the chilling encounter, the image of those haunting eyes forever etched in my memory. I don't know what it was that I saw that night, but it remains one of the most terrifying experiences of my life. Not me but my father experienced it. It was last summer in the evening and we lice pretty secluded. He came back later that evening and told me that he saw S-5-6 light balls flying in formation near his location, away from him. While doing so they changed their formation regularly and even though he couldn't estimate how fast they really were, at least from his view they started out slow and accelerated a lot till he lost sight. He asked me if this could have been some natural occurrence, because he said he never saw STH like that before. My X-Files trained brain screamed UFOs, after I told my father that with a smirk grin in my face, he made me promise not to tell anybody about this, to prevent his buddies making fun of him. Man, I'm so jealous that he got to see it and not me. My husband has always been an avid outdoorsman and loves to swap stories with his friends about their adventures in the wild. I remember one evening when we were sitting by the fire, and he shared a chilling tale that had been passed down to him by a close friend. As a pregnant woman with a foggy memory, I'll try my best to recount the story as it was told to me. His friend, let's call him Mark, had been an experienced hunter and was no stranger to spending nights alone in the wilderness. One autumn day, he ventured deep into the woods, hoping to bag a deer from his tree stand a hideout spot nestled high up in the branches. As the sun began to set, Mark settled into his tree stand, waiting patiently for his prey. But as night fell, an eerie stillness settled over the forest, broken only by the occasional rustle of leaves. It wasn't long before Mark realized that he wasn't alone. From the darkness, he could hear strange noises, unlike anything he had ever encountered in his years of hunting. The sounds were guttural and menacing, sending a shiver down his spine. Paralyzed with fear, Mark could only sit there, praying that whatever was stalking him would lose interest and move on. But the creature, whatever it was, didn't leave. Instead, it stayed throughout the entire night, its chilling presence a constant source of terror for Mark. The once brave hunter was reduced to a quivering mess, his mind racing with thoughts of what might happen if the creature decided to strike. Finally, morning arrived, and with it, a renewed sense of courage. Seizing the opportunity, Mark climbed down from his tree stand and sprinted back to his car, not daring to look back. He never did find out what had stalked him that night, but the experience left a lasting impression on him. As my husband finished recounting the story, I couldn't help but feel a chill run down my spine. I knew that the woods held many mysteries and unknown dangers, but this tale was a stark reminder that sometimes, the most terrifying encounters are those that we cannot explain. I was hunting on my uncle's property in southern Kentucky, near Daniel Boone NF, in the summer of 2011. He also had a good size pond down in the very woodsy part of his 60 acres and I set up some fishing poles at night rigged to land some catfish. It was about a 20 minute walk from camp to the pond and it was a pitch black night, also very quiet. I specifically noticed a lack of critter noise including insects. I walked down through the field and reached the pond which sat up against miles of forest. 
My only light was my headlamp. As I was reeling in one of the poles, I must have spooked something and heard an enormous splash and something let out a massive wailing slash grunting noise and crashed through the forest, it was seriously so loud that it rattled my chest. I dropped the pole and hauled ass back to my camp, full on fight or flight mode. When I told my uncle about it, he looked petrified and talked about how he is convinced a Sasquatch lives on his land due to similar occurrences he has had. All I know is that it scared me so badly to the point that I haven't been back. I've backpacked and hunted all over, I've never experienced anything like those noises. Almost a year ago, I was an opener at a resort, clocking in before 5 am each day. The resort is located inside of an affluent neighborhood, in a very wealthy town suburb. Employees had to park in one of two parking lots at either ends of the property, and the lot I chose was adjacent to a long and windy road outside the resort which lead to the rest of the neighborhood. The road and resort were separated by a short range of brush and trees that no one ever walked through. I'd arrived one morning per usual and put the car into park with my headlights still on. The lights in the lot weren't ever on in the morning since no one else really showed up before 6 am when the sun was out, so it was usually always dark at the start of my walk. Save for security, I was one of the first employees to arrive on the property each morning and was usually completely alone in this particular parking lot at this time, this morning didn't seem any different. I had my hand literally at my keys, my brain in the process to turn off my car, when I noticed a young girl maybe like 14 or 15 years old, come scampering, her body language was the exact definition. Run with quick light steps, especially through fear or excitement. Through the span of trees that separates the resort from the outside road. She was directly in front of my car, and my headlights illuminated a clear view of her in the pitch black. She looked like she was in high school, had long, blonde hair, and was wearing a jacket with pajamas maybe, like she just walked out of a house. One thing about her that bothered me was that she wouldn't stop laughing and smiling. I couldn't hear her laughing from outside the car, but she was visually giggling at something I wasn't aware of or could see, and it was so unnatural. She occasionally glanced behind her as if someone else were there waiting away from the headlights. She then waved at me like it were a normal gesture at this time and then immediately ran to my passenger side door. This all happened in a matter of seconds, and I wasn't really sure what was even happening besides my anxiety spiking. I know I simultaneously yanked the O from my phone to shut whatever song had been playing off while grabbing for the lock button. I remember feeling panic for never remembering if it's up or down to lock when the girl began pulling violently and incessantly on the door handle on the passenger's side. I realized because I didn't turn my car off, it had stayed locked. She began pounding on the window, and I was screaming at the top of my lungs for her to leave before pressing on my horn. I could see her laughing outside like this were some type of game, as if I were a silly friend not letting her in as a joke. After a few seconds, she stopped the pounding and trying to open my car door. Her face fell flat like I disappointed her, and she started to walk away from my car back the way she came. She waved at me again before squeezing through the trees, out of the view of my headlights. This whole encounter confused me almost as much as it scared me. Most people I told the story to just chalked it up to her being on drugs, but that narrative hasn't felt right to me despite her behavior. Maybe she was just being an extremely out of touch teenager whose parents need a firmer grip on her. My first thought was possibly human trafficking, but I'm not sure if that would fit this scenario as I'm not the most well versed with the subject. I told someone when I made it to LP, but they didn't seem to care much. I didn't call the police, and I regret that. I'll never get out of my brain though how messed off the feeling was watching a stranger, seemingly alone, pop out from the trees in the darkness laughing and then try to violently enter your car in an empty parking lot. I do think the possibility of someone else being present the whole time is a lot more scary, and I wonder who else was there and where exactly.
The first encounter happened back when I was in 8th or 9th grade, can't remember exactly. I was friends with a bunch of guys and girls who were a year ahead of me, all of which I had met through my best friend Tom. Well, our little circle of friends went out for a night of bowling. The group consisted of myself, Tom, Jeremy, Beth, and Beth's friend Ashley. Beth had just broken up with her boyfriend, Corey. Corey was a real piece of work, extremely arrogant, pushy, possessive, and controlling. This was only my second time meeting Beth and Ashley and I was unaware of the breakup or even of Corey's existence. We had our fun bowling and wandered out to the picnic table surrounding the bowling alley and adjacent go-kart track, by which time it's getting rather late. All of the sudden Beth and Ashley start getting texts and phone calls from their friends and Beth becomes visibly shaken. The two of them promptly, and with little explanation, run off to another section of the property. Tom, Jeremy, and I are confused as hell. We get clued in, by texts, that Corey has gone full on, hardcore stalker mode and basically interrogated a bunch of his and Beth's mutual friends in order to figure out where she was. And he was on his way here now. No sooner than we had figured that out when we see him and his posse or entourage stroll into the picnic area. They spot the three of us chilling at our table and Corey apparently tells his guys to stay where they are before walking very pointedly towards us. Completely unannounced, he leans over onto our table, putting his face level with, and uncomfortably close to, ours. So, where's Beth? Now I had never met the guy, but he was already giving me really bad vibes. Both Jeremy and Tom already despised him from previous encounters with the guy. As such, we had all made the unspoken agreement to cover for Beth. We don't know, Jeremy and Tom replied, just shrugging and trying to brush the question off with their best poker faces. Corey just stares us each down in turn, unblinking, clearly trying to intimidate us. We stare right back. Oh yeah? He asks. Well I know she's here. And that's when he said the words I'll never forget. The same statement that made every stalker alert and warning bell go off in my head simultaneously, she hasn't been answering my calls. But it's okay, because now I've got a new truck, so that means when she doesn't answer my calls, I can come find her. His voice was intense. He was completely, 100% serious and stared me dead in the eye as he said it. As soon as he made that little proclamation, the atmosphere at the table went from tense to about one step short of a full-scale brawl. My legs were under the table, so I slowly edged them out to the side and clenched my fists, ready to go to blows with this creeper if I had to. There was a little more small talk with threatening undertones, from both sides, that I don't remember much of, before Corey finally relented. He went back to regroup with his posse. He stuck around, though and it started to seem like he might be working up the courage to start something. However, we made it clear that we wouldn't be backing down and Jeremy started spreading the word, very obviously, that I was armed, I wasn't, based on a joking comment I'd made earlier in the night. It seemed to do the trick. Luckily, Beth emerged from hiding and finally talked Corey down. He promptly went from threatening to sort of creepy friendly tried to show off his new truck to us and make small talk. Beth and Ashley peeled out of their pretty quick like, understandably, afterward. The night proceeded without incident. Fast forward about four years. Corey and Beth had more drama as time went by, with him sending threatening and harassing texts, spreading lies to damage her reputation, etc. At one point they actually got back together, Tom and I made our disapproval abundantly clear to Beth, but that didn't last long before the two broke up again. One day, Tom and I are at Jeremy's house, where he and his girlfriend, Tara, are in contact with Beth, who's working her shift at a large, local sporting goods store. Tara, after some texts and a phone call, puts her phone down and has this really concerned look. We ask her what's up and she tells us all that Corey is at Beth's workplace. At first he just kinda wandered around the aisles, staring at her. 
but then he actually took one of the hunting knives on stock out of its case and began brandishing slash toying with it as he stared at her, roaming around the store as he did so. Tom heard this and immediately began to march downstairs to his truck, with me following right behind him. He was absolutely pissed. Keep in mind that Tom's a pretty big guy, very athletic with a potentially nasty temper. He had done some MMA training in the past. To top it all off, he's an active duty infantryman and army ranger. He was on leave from training when this was cluster F was going down. Now consider the fact that he had an AR-15, with ammunition, in his truck. Not a good situation for anyone involved, least of all the stalker. Of course I was really pumped up too, but at the same time I didn't want to see my friend go off half-cocked and end up in jail or worse. Jeremy and Tara talked us both down and I was about to call the police when Beth contacted us, saying she was all clear. She had talked to her manager about the situation and Corey had ended up finally leaving, while the manager walked Beth to her car in the parking lot, the stalker's truck was out there, waiting for her. I talked with Beth extensively after the incident, advising her that I had connections with the police department and all of the local judges, which is true. She already had plenty of grounds on which to file for a protective order, if not stalking slash harassment charges. Alas, she decided to let the matter drop and luckily the guy hasn't shown his face again. Still, I wouldn't be surprised if he tries something else in the future. I used to work as a police officer, but I left the job about a year ago to pursue my passion for outdoor activities. So, last summer, I went on a camping trip with a group of friends to the Illahi flat near Roseburg. We were having a great time, enjoying the beautiful scenery and the peace and quiet of the forest. But then, something strange happened. We were all gathered around the campfire, chatting and roasting marshmallows, when we heard a rustling in the woods. At first, we thought it was just an animal, but then we saw a huge creature emerge from the trees. It was a Bigfoot. At least, that's what it looked like to me. It was about three to four hundred feet away, but even from that distance, I could see it clearly. It was walking on two legs, just like a human, and swinging its arms as it moved. It was a surreal sight and I could feel the hair on the back of my neck standing up. There were 12 of us there, and we all saw the creature. Some of us were scared, while others were just fascinated by the sight. We watched as the Bigfoot crossed a 600-foot wide clearing, then disappeared into the woods on the other side. After the creature had gone, half of the people at the campsite left that night. I don't blame them. It was a strange and unsettling experience, one that I'll never forget. As a police officer, I've seen some weird things in my time. But this was something else entirely. I've never seen anything like it, and I'm not sure I want to again. I was bow hunting with my husband, father-in-law and 14-year-old brother-in-law. We had just set out on our evening hunt, having arrived at camp the day before. We split into two groups, my husband and I headed uphill, my father-in-law and brother-in-law downhill. An hour or so after we split up, my husband and I heard a scream below us and seemingly centered in heavy area of brush slash trees in a hollow at the base of the hill. The scream was long and very guttural. The hair stood up on our necks. We went to locate father-in-law and brother-in-law. Upon meeting them, they told us that they too had heard it. My young brother-in-law was more than a little shook up. His dad had left him near a tree to see if he could jump some elk towards him. Both were very close to the sound since they had been downhill from us. My brother-in-law felt it was very near to him and was very relieved when his dad showed up to check on him after hearing the scream. We spent a little time that night trying to determine what it was. My husband and father-in-law have spent most of their lives hunting slash fishing and camping in various areas of Oregon, this one in particular. They hadn't heard anything like it. It was too deep for cat and my father-in-law swears it wasn't a bear. I listened to the tape on your site and although it was similar, 
The sound I heard was a little deeper and more guttural. I used to work as a police officer. I'm from France, so that's where all this takes place. I quit the job about five years ago. My mother's health was declining fast at the time, and I needed more time to take care of her, and my mother passed away not even a year after that. But I've not returned to the job to this day. I don't plan on going back at all, partly because of the weird things I'm about to tell you about. I was out one night, and the person I was with, well, we were not the best of friends. I felt like he was too aggressive and rude with people. Not the type of person you want to have power over others. I'm basically saying that he was a prick who thought he was better than everybody and everybody made sure to abuse his position of power whenever he could. Nobody really liked working with him. He was every bad picture you could want to paint. Sexist, racist, very homophobic, and a narcissist. Imagine how he acted around me. I knew that he despised me. It called my life choices disgusting multiple times. This might sound really strange, but I feel like everything he said was questionable or downright awful. Sometimes it was his glass falling off the table and breaking. Sometimes it was his car alarm going off, and sometimes there were random noises around him, like random screaming. This one time, we had heard random shots next to us when we were investigating a robbery, and he couldn't help but say some horrible stuff about the black woman and her child living there. I really don't know how to explain it. It's like something was following him around and bowling him. He completely ignored it, though, pretended like we were just imagining things. There was no way he didn't see it. It wasn't karma. It was something bad, like an entity. I knew that it made all of us feel uncomfortable and kind of scared in some way. It was freaky, and that one night I was working with him was the most confusing night of my life. He was exceptionally grumpy that evening and made sure to show me throughout our entire shift. He kept on complaining about his family, his neighbors, and our colleagues and gossiping to my face. I tried my best to ignore him, but it began getting out of hand. He was really starting to piss me off. Throughout the night, there were several small incidents that happened. Some small and not too worrisome, but some were really scaring me. The first thing that happened in the car was the radio all of a sudden turning up in static. He turned it down and continued driving as if he didn't think it was weird. After a little while during one of his obnoxious rants, his coffee cup flew out of the cup holder towards him. This one scared me. It obviously couldn't have fallen out of the cup holder. It was basically launched at him. Again, he didn't seem to care at all and continued talking. After that, it was quiet for a while. Not that many people were out and about on the streets, so the shift was more calm. Everything turned around after that, though. It just got way worse. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw something running from the side of the road right in front of our car. We hit the brakes, and before he could come to a stop, you could feel that we had hit it. What I saw looked like a black cat, so I just assumed we had killed it. I was surprised by him breaking. I didn't think he's the type of person that cared about that. You'd almost expect him to drive faster for something like that. We both got out of the car to see what happened, but to our surprise, there was nothing. I was sure that we had hit an animal, we both did, and he was just as confused as I was but said the animal had probably been able to get away from the vehicle, that maybe we had just hit something else, and none of this made sense whatsoever. We got back into the car, we were both very quiet at this point. After a couple of minutes, I almost launched out of my seat, my partner hits the brakes out of the car out of nowhere. We come to a stop, and I asked him what had happened. Now he looked scared. I had not seen him act like this ever, so it worried me. He told me that whilst we were driving, he sees a light behind the car, so he looks into the rear view mirror, and what he had seen terrified him. In the back seat of the car, according to him, was a woman, dressed in all black, she stared right at him with a straight face. He said he immediately pushed the brakes, and when he looked back up, she was gone. I could tell that he was not okay at all. As soon as he told me this, 
I saw somebody standing to the other side of the road from the corner of my eye. I soon turned around to look from there, they were then gone. I cannot tell you how uncomfortable I felt. Seeing him being equally as freaked out as I was made it worse. He had ignored everything up until this point but could not ignore what we had seen that night. We didn't talk about it after. You'd expect something like that to change a person, and after a couple of days of him being more quiet, he went back to his old ways. I'm Peter, a wildlife biologist, and I've been studying the Bigfoot phenomenon for years. I've always been fascinated by these creatures, and I've spent countless hours researching and investigating sightings all over the country. One summer evening, I received a call from two young men who claimed to have seen a group of Bigfoot moving along a ridge near the outskirts of town. They were both very excited and insisted that I come out to see for myself. I decided to bring my friend Todd, a local police officer, with me for backup. We arrived at the site just before sunset and immediately set up our equipment. Using our binoculars, we scanned the ridge, looking for any sign of the creatures. After a few minutes, we spotted them. Seven Bigfoot were moving between the trees, and we could see their individual faces. We were absolutely positive about what we were seeing. Todd and I combed the ridge for several hours, but we were unable to find any sign that the creatures had passed. The partially frozen ground had tracks of other creatures, elk, deer, and coyote, but nothing that could be attributed to the Bigfoot. As we packed up our gear and prepared to leave, I couldn't help but feel a sense of disappointment. I had hoped to get some concrete evidence of these elusive creatures, but it seemed like they had vanished into thin air. Maybe this was one for the Bigfoot from another dimension crowd, I thought to myself. I didn't know what to believe anymore. That Friday night, cryptid investigator visited the site and stayed until 5 a.m., recording only owl noises. It seemed like the Bigfoot had disappeared without a trace, leaving us with more questions than answers. I come from Phoenix, Arizona. I haven't traveled to many places during my life, but I was born, raised, and schooled there. Since I didn't want a boring city job, but I didn't feel like moving either, I signed up to be a ranger in the Tonto National Forest. The job wasn't easy or fun all the time, but at least I didn't have to sit in a crowded office all day. I loved my job for the most time, up until a crazy night that I won't forget. I was working my third shift, starting late in the evening. While doing the first tour, it was still fairly light outside. There wasn't a whole lot to see, many people had already gone home, and the rest were well on their way. I finished the tour, headed back to my station, and time flew by quickly. I was already getting prepared to do the second and longest tour of my shift. I had to walk about four miles down a rocky road all the way to the Theodore Roosevelt Lake. The walk down was quite easy and very quiet. I reached the lake in less than one hour. I was a bit tired from walking, so I sat by the lake to try and get some rest. The first thing I heard was a splash. It sounded like a very large fish jumping out, falling back into the water. Shortly after that, there was another, but this one was closer and louder. It sounded far too big for a fish. I got startled a little bit, so I stood up and began slowly backing away from the lake. The thing in the water began to speed up as well and I could see something was waving its tail towards the shore. Still walking backward, I was focused to see what will emerge from the water, and the first thing I saw was a mouth, a huge mouth, and a long one with many teeth slowly creeping off from the lake. I moved faster back up the hill, turning my head to see what was behind me. After a few steps, when I turned my head, I realized the creature was already running towards me at full speed looking somehow crocodilian. Its legs were short but having huge claws on its feet. It resembled the famous bear lick monster. I was terrified. Even though it was short, it was moving and closing the distance between us. My instincts kicked in, and I managed to pull myself up quite high on one of the pine trees. 
I stayed up there for a whole seven hours while this thing waited for me to come down. Only when the sun had come up had it disappeared. I finally got off the tree and sprinted the full four miles to the station. They sent over divers and some police, but they didn't take what I had reported too seriously. I still work there, but I refuse to go near that side of the forest, and trust me, I get crap for it all the time from my buddies. I am a police officer and I have been working in the area for quite some time now. I have heard a lot of strange stories and unexplainable sightings, but nothing quite like what Scott Sebring had reported to me. Three months ago, Scott received a report of a dogman sighting from the Northwest Portland area. He didn't have any details at the time, but he promised to get them. The sighting had apparently taken place on Skyline Road, just west of the junction with Cornelius Pass Road. This area has had numerous sightings in the past, but this one was different. When Scott finally got the details, he found out that the sighting had been witnessed by a couple driving along Skyline Road at night. They reported seeing a large, hairy creature crossing the road in front of them. They described it as standing on two legs, with long arms that swung as it moved. They were both so frightened that they didn't even stop to investigate. As a police officer, I couldn't ignore this report. I decided to investigate the area with Scott. We spent several hours combing the area, but we couldn't find any sign of the creature. The partially frozen ground had tracks of other animals, like elk, deer, and coyote, but nothing that resembled a dogman. Scott has been actively seeking dogman spore in the area. The most recent discovery was just three weeks ago near Lostine, Oregon. He has built a blind and has been studying the area for weeks. He found tracks ranging from 19 to 9 inches in size, and he discovered that cutthroat trout were common in the area, as were cattail roots and willow shoots. At one place, we found a 3-inch limb that had been snapped. There were apparent finger marks still visible on the limb. It was a strange discovery, and we couldn't quite explain it. It seemed like something had been there and had used the limb as a tool. In the end, we didn't find any concrete evidence of dog man, but the sightings and discoveries were enough to make us wonder what else was out there. I am a conductor for Union Pacific Railroad working pool freight from Portland, Oregon to Hermiston. We were traveling westbound on a train going around curves between Bonneville, Cascade Locks, and Dodson. As we came around a curve near milepost 36, I saw something dark between the rails. I said to the engineer, what is that? He then blew the whistle. Something tall and hairy with long arms got up and ran into the trees and brush. Its arms swung wildly when it ran. We looked into the spot where the animal went into cover, but could not see it. Time was daybreak. We got a good look as we approached at about 15 rail car lengths. So this guy and his partner get called to this woman's house. She is hysterical, terrified out of her mind. Both of the officers are trying to calm her down enough for her to tell them what is wrong. Finally, she catches her breath and tells them that he is coming to get her. The officers ask who he is. The lady starts flipping out again. They get her calmed down again and ask her who she believes is trying to hurt her. Her answer, Mr. Freeze. Yes, the Batman villain. So the officer who told me this story looks at his partner, who just sighs and starts to radio in the false alarm. But then the lady starts freaking out again talking about how Mr. Freeze is coming. So my buddy grabs the woman and tells her it's okay. He tells her he can't believe she doesn't know about Mr. Freeze's weakness. He tells his partner to give him all the change in his pockets and he does. My buddy starts digging through the change to find quarters. Each time he finds one, he throws it into a corner of the room, until all the corners had a quarter in them. Then he tells the woman she is safe because Mr. Freeze can't come into a room that is secured in this way. He gave the woman the rest of the change and left. They never got another call from this lady.
My husband is a social worker and worked in the Austin State Hospital for a while. He was doing emergency mental health work with the police and their unit was stationed at the hospital. ASH is pretty well known for being haunted. He was working late one night in an office with huge floor-to-ceiling windows. The office did not have any blinds or window treatments, so when the lights are on at night the area outside the windows are pitch black. One of the windows was actually a door that was always locked. He doesn't even think it opens anymore because the building is so old. The area outside the windows is a courtyard that is inaccessible because it's sandwiched by other buildings. To get to it you'd need a key to get through one of the, generally never opened, doors from one of the other buildings. Most of these buildings are empty or abandoned. ASH was defunded years ago so a lot of the buildings are in total disrepair. This particular night, he was alone and got up to go to the bathroom. He was always creeped out by the windows. When he got up to go to the bathroom he looked out the window and saw a man standing in the abandoned courtyard staring back at him. He freaked out and called security. They searched the area and never found anyone. He told his co-workers and they said don't ever tell me anything like that again. He used to joke that it was a ghost who would attack counselors but not social workers to freak out his LPC co-workers. Used to do armed security in Denver. If you are familiar with the Lakewood area, there is a place called Claire Gardens. Next to that is a retirement community called Francis Heights. And connected to the heights is a nursing home called Dayspring. Place is rumored to be haunted. I was told that it was all built over an old orphanage that was ran by two nuns and a priest whom neglected the orphans there and apparently some of the kids that died are buried there. Some of the ladies on the night cleaning staff were about to quit because they would clean the glass panes on the windows and doors, then return later to find little handprints on them. The residents would complain that they could hear kids running up and down the halls laughing and playing. There is an indoor gym next door, and my partner and I got bored one night and decided to go investigate to see if anything scary happened. I remember that sometimes in photos, paranormal things can be captured on film that we can't see with the naked eye. Took a random picture of the inside of the gym while my partner was off exploring and when I looked at the picture, I saw what appeared to be the shadow slash silhouette of a person standing there looking down at its feet. Decided not to explore so much after that. I am writing a book about the crazy experiences that happened on the job. People think nothing happens on duty as a -a rent-a-cop. We have our days too lol. I'm a hospital chaplain. I was on call one night. I got a call from a nurse about 3 am saying that she got stuck with a psych patient, as they were considered psychotic but not enough to be placed in the behavioral health unit. The patient was admitted a few days back, but suddenly just stopped talking to the nurses, other than saying I'm dead, and I can't talk to the living. Working in an area with many drug abuse patients and an unusually high amount of psych patients, an event like this wasn't too strange. However seeing as they were having a hard time trying to communicate with the patient, the nurse was kind of fed up and just called the on-call chaplain to see if I could help. I arrive at about 3 am, and the nurse tells me what I just told you. The nurse escorts me in the room and the patient gives her the same one-liner spiel. Upon seeing me, she said oh, you're dead too. I can talk to you. The patient then indicated for the nurse to leave and I sat and talked for a good hour of this patient's concerns how they were going to die soon and felt unable to talk to any of the living. However, the patient insisted that I was dead too and that I was the only one she could talk to. Without breaking HIPPA, she gave some general end-of-life concerns one would typically see, with the added benefit of how she was able to get glimpses of heaven but because of this could not really talk to the living. Having personally responded to other behavioral health complaints involving religious psychosis, I took this as another typical case. I was able to get the information and communicate the wishes of the nurse, and after explaining the details to the nurse left shortly that after. I made it back home and I'm just getting to sleep, 
as I get a call from the operator saying there is a code in the same room and patient I just left, and I was asked to come back in. By the time I made it to the hospital the patient had died. Arguably the weirdest case I've ever handled. When I was 19 to 20 I lived in Maryland and was obsessed with photographing abandoned houses in some of the run-down suburban areas around where I grew up. I got arrested, aka driven home in cuffs and slapped on the wrist, a lot for trespassing but I was dumb and this didn't stop me. So I went to this abandoned house that supposedly a cop was killed in and now no one lived there. It was pretty odd inside. The floor was a foot deep with just broken furniture and detritus. It was like whoever abandoned the place left everything they owned there and then kids came in and smashed it all and left it on the floor. Creepy house but I didn't feel anything oppressive or weird about it. I was there during the day, alone, but I didn't get any chills or anything. Took photos of the downstairs and then went upstairs. The stairs were wood and looked pretty secure, not obviously rotted or anything. While I'm up there I heard a cop car pull up outside and chirp its siren. Two cops came into the house and I yelled down where I was. One of the cops told me to stay there and started to come upstairs. I had gone up no problem and this dude was a skinny little rookie looking dude so we were honestly probably the same weight. Except that every time he put his weight on one of the steps, it broke. Sometimes just a little so he kept going but twice his foot went all the way through the step. It was the weirdest thing. Eventually he backed off and I came down. None of the upper steps broke for me and I jumped down over the broken ones. They took me home and it was fine but that's still the weirdest experience of my life. Maybe something in that house still really hated cops. Back in high school my friend's family had a break in. This family lived in a rural area and their land was a little tough to find. Most people got lost trying to find it the first time and usually they'd need to send someone to the road to flag down anyone that might be looking for them. Law enforcement, pizza guy, guests, etc. Some guy had broken into one of the sheds and had possibly stolen something so they had called the police in the middle of the night. This particular night, they didn't want to send anyone to the road because they thought the burglar was armed and possibly still in the area. The police seemed to have found their land easily and went about their business for the night, investigating the shed and sweeping the property. They found the guy hiding in the barn and arrested him, open and shut case. Homeless transient that nabbed some tools from the shed. Once they were wrapping up, one of them said it was okay to call the lady that flagged them down at the entrance to their land back to the house. The family hadn't sent anyone to the road. I was working at around 2 am on the north end of my jurisdiction on a dirt road that dipped slightly down an elevation into a tamarack and red-white pine swamp. I'm patrolling along the road because it's a known back way for drunk drivers to take to avoid the main route at bar time in between neighboring villages. Just south of me a quarter mile as the crow flies is a small Native American reservation populated with residential. But I'm essential working somewhere that I shouldn't see anyone other than passing vehicles, certainly no one on foot. It's end summer early fall where the days are warm but the nights were cold. As I'm driving I have my window down enjoying the brisk temps, I'm a Wisconsinite, and for some reason I was driving fairly slow, probably only about 20 miles per hour. Off to my left I hear very distinctly the sound of water thrashing, and my mind initially thinks I hear maybe a deer or a bear running through the water. Had seen a black bear the night before near where I was on this night. I came to a quick stop and used my spotlight and left alley takedown floodlight to hit where I thought I'd see something like the black bear fellow, but there was zero movement, just the sound of weighty water slushing away from me. Where I was looking was not thick with woods, but more adolescent pines and smaller underbrush with a dry ridge only 50 yards away from me. I had lots of clear sight lines in between larger pines to the hill past the water. I estimated the water to be only maybe a foot deep, but as I'm seeing nothing make the sounds that I'm hearing, 
My mind then thinks that maybe it's a someone in the water but hiding behind a tree to avoid me, and so I have a concern for them because of how cold it was that morning. But I see nothing. The sounds of water moving was very distinct and to me sounded bipedal, and heavy, and my perception was telling me that I should be seeing something only a couple dozen feet away from me, but there was just the sound. I called out asking if anyone was there, but nothing, the swishing of water stopped, and I saw nothing walking up the ridge as if it had cleared the water. I didn't spend much longer looking into the barely lit woods over the water, I rolled my window up and continued on briefly hoping that I hadn't stranded a guy in the dark cold wet woods that's what my rational mind was thinking. But there was definitely a shit alarm going off in my lizard brain telling me to boot scoot the f out of there the moment I didn't see anything running through the water. It was a back of the neck tingly moment. The noise was so loud, enough to hear it while driving in a vehicle. But there was only the pretty calm shimmer of the water and nothing that I could see running through a foot of water. This happened two falls ago and I remember that morning every time I drive through there. As a former paramedic and nurse, I've seen a lot of things that have made me question the nature of our existence. But one aspect of the job, in particular, stands out as evidence of something beyond our understanding. Have you ever seen someone die? I mean really die, not just slip into a coma or vegetative state. I've seen people die and yet their body carries on for hours, almost as if they're still alive but something has left them. It's hard to describe, but you can tell when someone is no longer there. It's like the light has gone out of their eyes, their body is just an empty vessel. But here's the thing, I've also seen the opposite happen. In traumatic deaths, when the body is failing and should be giving up, the person keeps on fighting. It's almost as if their will to live is stronger than their body's ability to keep going. I know this may not be proof of a higher power or the afterlife, but it does prove to me that there's more to our existence than we can comprehend. It's a humbling and awe-inspiring realization. To know that there's still so much we don't understand about life and death. And it's made me more grateful for every moment I have on this earth. I'm working a maintenance job, midnight to 5 a.m., in the old Denver Light and Gas Building 15th and Champa downtown Denver. There's a few people around there during the day, but after hours the place is pretty empty. I'm working by myself and haven't seen a person all night, I go to the bathroom on the third floor, which is a narrow long room. Walk in the door two urinals directly to your left, then two stalls after, then a sink against the wall behind the stalls, then interior wall of the building. I hit the first urinal and as I'm finishing I hear plain as day the sink turn on and a variances in the water noise like someone is washing their hands. I zip up turn and the sink stops. So I just stand at the end of the stall because there's maybe two feet between the stalls and the wall that leads to the sink and it just dead ends at the sink so there's not really room for two people to pass each other and definitely not enough room at the sink for two people. It only took maybe two or three seconds, but I'm like WTF? There's nobody else in here with me. I wasn't tired, I can honestly say I heard what I heard, and I don't get freaked out imagining things. It's the only one thing in my life that I've ever experienced like that. Been there several time after and haven't heard anything like it since. I have always been an avid hunter, spending most of my free time out in the woods. I have hunted everything from deer to turkeys and even tried my luck at trapping. However, nothing could have prepared me for what I experienced one spring morning 15 years ago. I was turkey hunting on my family's property along the Grand River in Ionia County, Michigan. The birds had flown down from the roost and gone in the opposite direction of where they usually went, making it challenging to track them down. Despite my efforts, I couldn't get them to come to any calls. Frustrated, I decided to take a quick nap and leaned against a big oak tree. It was a beautiful day, and the warmth of the sun felt good on my skin. I must have drifted off because I woke up to the sound of the strangest roaring sound I have ever heard. It was like nothing I had ever experienced before, 
and it sounded like it was right on top of me. I was instantly filled with fear, thinking that some creature was going to tear me to pieces. I held my 12 gauge tightly, ready to defend myself. The sound came again, and this time it was directly overhead. I looked up to see a hot air balloon above the treetops with a blonde woman firing the burner, and an elderly couple looking like they were having the time of their lives. Feeling relieved, I let out a deep breath and chuckled at my reaction. It was then that I heard something else, something in the distance, and it didn't sound like any animal I knew. I froze, unsure of what to do. I listened carefully, and the sound became louder and more distinct. It was then that I saw it, a Sasquatch. At first, I couldn't believe my eyes, thinking it was a bear, but as it came closer, I could see it was something else. It stood over 8 feet tall and was covered in dark hair. Its eyes met mine, and for a moment, we just stared at each other. Then, it turned and walked away, disappearing into the woods. I sat there in shock, trying to make sense of what had just happened. For years, I had heard stories about Sasquatches, but I had never believed them until that moment. It was a surreal experience that left me questioning what else was out there that we didn't know about. From that day on, I always made sure to keep my eyes and ears open, knowing that anything was possible when it came to the mysteries of the forest. I first met my wife some 22 years ago. Shortly thereafter I was warmly welcomed into the annual family deer camp, they must have seen the hook in my mouth that escaped me at the time because they were very guarded about access to the property and no one outside of the family hunted it with rare exception. One of the first things her uncle proudly showed me was the family collection of stone points. I recall counting at least 75 distinct pieces, if not more. I am by no means an expert on the subject. But from the limited research I've done the collection represented a broad range of time from the Neolithic to the Woodland Indian period. I was of course curious why he would show me these points prior to my first opening day of deer season with my soon-to-be in-laws. The question was answered when he told me I'm showing you this so you understand there are things you won't understand at times when you're out there. I had no idea what this meant until one turkey season some four or five years later. Mind you, I had archery and gun hunted the property many times in those first few years with good success. I had never been truly scared when on stand before daylight or waiting for dark to climb down so I wouldn't scare the deer lingering in the fields. Sure, I was creeped out a few times due to my own imagination, but nothing like what I experienced that April dusk. I had been out for a couple hours before dark, trying to pattern the birds and see where they were roosting. My plan was to find that out and come out the next morning ready to bust a nice gobbler right after fly down. Of course the birds ended up roosting on the far southwest corner of the property, about as far you could get from where my truck was parked on the north end near the old stagecoach Ford area, just south of the house. The sun had just set as I neared the Ford area. I was maybe 200 yards from the Ford when I saw what I thought was a light on a boat close to the opposite river bank. As I got closer, I heard splashing and saw the light bob back and forth. No big deal until I heard the distinct sound of horse leather and metal bits and pieces clinking and squeaking, along with a low voice alternately calling what sounded like G and haw. Before you ask how do I know that what that means and sounds like, I grew up on a farm and my father had a team of ponies that he used in pulling competitions. I also had two uncles that had Belgian draft horses they showed at county fairs and pulled wagons in what seemed like every small town's festival parade for 40 miles around. I can't tell you how many times growing up I saw pony pulling competitions or tossed candy out of a wagon in a parade. Back to the lights and sounds, I didn't really process it at first. I kept thinking those are weird sounds to be coming from someone night fishing. My truck was parked about 125 yards more or less due west from the fort on the two track that led up the hill and out to the road. As I got closer the light and sound seemed as if they were crossing the river, heading toward the back area of the house slash old stagecoach stop. The closer I got, the dimmer the light got and the quieter the splashing, voices, 
and creaking and clinking became. I don't know when the light went out or the sounds died away because at this point I had stopped walking and was running at a pace that would shame Forrest Gump. I made it to my truck in record time, started it up, and flew up the two track and out to the road quivering like a scared child. There is a good sized field, give or take 60 acres, along the river just south of the old ford. This field is longer than wide running north to south. More than a few stone points have been found in this field over the years. The entire area to this day is full of deer and turkey, and was probably even more so before white men. Heck, I'm sure there were elk, deer, wolves, and bear in abundance in those times when it was all forest. It was for sure fertile hunting ground, and people have been there for thousands of years. To this point I have been remiss in pointing out the area across the river east of the property is a state game area. My wife's cousin is a solid guy. Let's call him Jay for these purposes. Jay. He is a hard-working family man, serious when he needs to be, and funny as hell in deer camp. I've never known him to exaggerate or stretch the truth. He relates a story when he was in high school and he and another cousin were tasked with dissing the big field along the river. They started on it one weeknight after dinner. It had been pretty dry and things were dusty. The way they went about it was he was on one tractor, slightly behind and to the side of the other cousin on his tractor going north and south. They did it this way so as to cover more ground and get it done quickly. Jay says they were about one third of the way through the field when the sun began to set. It was then he started to see in the tractor's headlights what he thought were the outlines of figures swirling in the dust kicked up by the discs and the tractors. His first thought was his mind was just playing trick on him, so he ignored it until the next pass when he got about midfield and distinctly saw what appeared to be people with long hair dressed in what he described as native clothing. When he got to the end of the field, the other cousin had stopped his tractor and was climbing off. Jay stopped his tractor, got off, and went to see what the other cousin wanted. He said they both stood looking at each for a moment when they both said at the same time, did you see anything weird in the dust, at which point they made a joint decision to haul us out of the field and come back and finish the job during daylight on the weekend. About eight years ago I was on a backpacking trip in the western Sierras in central California above Huntington Lake with a group of five guys from the Bowhunters League I was running at the archery shop I worked at. We had packed in the first day about nine miles to our first camp and had no issues. We had archery gear and had tags for deer and bears. When we woke up the next morning we hiked to a small high country lake to refill the water and head up above tree line to glass for deer. We were about a half mile from the lake and we heard what sounded like a limb snapping off a tree. We all joked about Bigfoot and carried on. The lake was in a big bowl surrounded by thick timber. As we were filling up our camelbacks and Nalgenes all four of us heard the same sound we heard on our way to the lake. It was five consecutive tree knocks from five different locations around the bowl. We finished filling up our water and got the hell out of there. We stayed another night without incident and headed home when one of the guys had a sleeping bag. Break and nighttime temps in the high 30s. On our way to the trailhead the first day we stopped in Shaver Lake and the area has had sightings in the past. Once you spend enough time out away from civilization you see and hear things that are not simply explained. I have had a few other experiences with strange lights and apparitions on separate occasions. I believe in most of it, but I don't let it take up too much real estate in my head. Four years ago we bought an old house. And from the get-go it freaked me out. It's a one-time owner but over 70 years old. A little old lady ran a day care out of it until she got too old. We bought and fixed it up as our first house. One. While remodeling the radio would change station by itself. I would have it on some rock and thought the first couple times it was my dad just changing the station. Then one day while working in the kitchen, where the radio was, 
It changed twice both from my station of rock to some straight up gangster stuff. 2. One night I was doing some work late and called my dad for a question about some electrical stuff. While my cell phone was trying to ring it turned white noise and I heard the words in old lady's voice, get out. I hung up and told my house off. I mean I really laid into it. Once I calmed down and realized I was alone I left. 3. Cabinets in my house will be open when I walk through to this day. 4. A series of pictures we took before the remodel had snow in only one room. Every picture in that room not the rest of the house. 5. Woke up one night to go pee walked out in the hall to the bathroom and threw my hands up in the air and yelled whoa. As a teacher this is a natural reaction right before I bump a child in the hall at school but there was no body in the hall. Just a shadow I saw for a second that seemed to be a young kid in the hall at my house. 6. Woke up one night with my eyes closed and had that feeling like I was being watched. I peeked and saw a little lady figure standing in the room. Closed my eyes real quick, then found the courage to look again and saw that it had moved to my wife's side of the bed. Got up and turned the light on and it had vanished. 7. Went to the bathroom closed the door. Was doing some calculus and the door opened. I leaned to close it and it opened again. I then left it open if a ghost wants to see and smell that I will let it. 8. A light in the closet in what used to be the little old lady's room will be randomly on. 9. Just now as I was looking at another thread the baby's rocker arm moved to the floor slowly. The rocker has an arm that folds over and locks into place. The arm was at a 90 degree after we got him out of it about 4 hours ago. Now it's all the way down. Like I said I don't believe in all this stuff. It's all just weird never threatening or mean. What do you guys think? I don't believe in ghosts or that paranormal stuff. I had one experience that was hard to shake. Back in my drinking partying days, I was at a friend's house and went to sleep in his guest room after a heavy night of drinking. Middle of the night, I wake up to someone shaking me. Physically. I felt their hand pushing on me. I look up and see the shadow of a man in the dark. I say Jeff, what do you want? Silence. Just standing there. I grab my phone which was next to me for some light, and it was gone. I think my drunken mind was playing tricks on me. When my wife and I bought our first house we had this eerie experience. The house was built in 1917 and two people had died at the house, an older lady inside and her husband on the front porch. We heard all the noises, doors opening, lights going on and off, that sort of thing. I started to fix the house up and things started getting worse. Any house plant put in a window sill would be smashed on the floor. Any clothes that I hung up on a dresser knob for work the next day would have the seams unsewn. I put a bottle of Jack on the refrigerator and it fell on the floor and landed on its top. I put it inside of a pot that my wife had on the fridge and the next night we heard a crash and it was on the floor again, on its top and this time it cracked the neck. Our dogs could see the ghost and you could watch as both dogs heads would turn in unison as they watched it go through a room. After a few years the strange things tapered off and finally quit. We sold the house to a single lady and she resold the house only a few months later and moved out. I saw her at the store and asked why she had moved. She told me about all the strange things that went on while she owned it and just couldn't take it. Although we toughed it out for 15 years she just couldn't take it and the house has sold several times since. My grandparents live in a private subdivision on the lake. There is a huge mansion out there that was built on an Indian burial ground. It's called the Myers Plantation. They owned all the land in the beginning and then started selling it off for people to build on and eventually became a private gated subdivision that had its own by laws until recent years. The Meyer Mansion had a big circle driveway. Growing up as kids there was always stories being told about ghosts and whatnot. Of course I believe them. Mr. and Mrs. Myers died years and years and years ago. 
It had a private pair and boathouse and no one had took care of it since they passed. It was falling apart and the woods were grown up all around it. Hell it did even have water around it anymore because the lake had receded so much over the years. Well you can still walk out there to it and find cane poles rigged up on what's left of the pier. You can take them down and come back and they will be back up again. The back of the house down to the lake is one fourth mile walk. There is a nice stone walkway the entire way. Well as we got older we got braver and braver to explore this land. The more we explored it the more we decided it was all lies and wasn't haunted or built on a graveyard. Well then one day going up those stairs one broke loose and tunnered over. It was a dang tombstone and so was all the other 15,000 stones used to make this stairway. I used to ride the go-kart around the streets and my papa always told me never to go into the Myers driveway. I would always turn around at the end of it and go back. It was at the end of the street. Well one day I got ballsy and decided I was gonna circle the driveway. So I did and pulled up to the front door and it had a huge awning over the front door area. As I started to glance around at the many many windows in the house I see the blinds moving in one window and then see a woman appear as the curtain is pulled back. This house has been vacant since the Myers passed. I hightailed it home and believe me I never went back in that driveway again. Needless to say I couldn't tell anyone what I saw because I wasn't supposed to be there to begin with lol. One late night I was was all alone at the house. I was in my room on the green screen. Laptop on bed and I was in a chair where I can see the door into the hallway. All of a sudden I see a blur go by the door. I figure it was late and my eyes playing tricks on me. And then I heard what sounded like someone running down the hall and then a door slam. Now every door in the house stays open unless you're using the restroom or sleeping, so I know all the doors are open. I grab my pistol and take a look see in the hall. Nobody in hall and my parents door was shut, but they were out of town. The alarm is set so I know no doors or windows were open. I call my buddy over and we clear that bedroom. Couldn't find nobody or any sign of anyone being in there. Not sure what that was but know what I heard and I know that the door was originally open. As a kid I used to wake up to see people standing around my bed. Not a crowd, but one or two or three. They'd be just standing there looking at me and sometimes around my brother's bed as well. I'd close my eyes and hightail it out of there to my parents' room and sleep on the floor for the rest of the night. It started on a family vacation to Maryland where we were staying in a large old home. I woke up to an old white lady with a black man standing in the doorway of this large room the adults put the kids in to sleep. She pointed at me and he walked over to my bed picked me up and laid me back down facing the other direction. I spun back around in the bed and they were gone. The second time was staying the night at my aunt's house, another person watching in the doorway. From there it progressed to be a more common occurrence. As I was getting older this was plain getting old. I remember one night trying to touch one of their hands but there was nothing tangible there. I know most are going to say it was the imagination of a child, but back then I swear it was real. So much that I'm getting goosebumps writing this. No lie. It all stopped when I prayed to Jesus to make me not see the people anymore. One prayer and it ended. Since they were never threatening figures I always considered them to be angels of sorts. Hence why they went invisible when I asked for them to go away. No they weren't white with wings, just people standing there. When I was 7 years old, my mom, my younger brother, and I were sitting in our living room watching TV. It was a typical evening, and we were all enjoying a relaxing night in. Our living room had an open layout and the kitchen was visible from where we were sitting. The kitchen table was right next to the living room, and one of the chairs was backed up to the carpet line. As we were watching TV, my mom's jacket, which was hanging on the back of the chair in the kitchen, suddenly started swaying back and forth. 
It was a strange sight because there was no air conditioner on, and all the doors and windows were closed. We all looked at each other in shock, wondering if we had just seen the same thing. At first, we thought it was just a strange draft, but as the jacket continued to sway, we started to feel uneasy. My brother and I clung to our mom, scared of what might happen next. It felt like an eternity before the jacket finally stopped moving, and we all let out a sigh of relief. Even though we tried to come up with a logical explanation for what we had seen, we couldn't shake off the feeling that something strange had happened. That experience stayed with us for a long time, and we always made sure to keep an eye on that chair in the kitchen. Looking back on it now, I still can't explain what caused the jacket to move like that, but it's a memory that will stay with me forever. My aunt told me a story of one night when she was around 12 years old, she's now 50. They would visit my great-grandmother in a small town in Mexico where she lived and where my father's side of the family is originally from. Anyway she told me she woke up one night and happened to look out the doorway, screen door, everyone slept with doors and windows open where she saw an old woman riding a donkey that was being pulled by a boy down the road please no donkey jokes. She thought to herself that was odd since it was the middle of the night. She recognized the old lady as an old family friend that had a small shop store down the road. She went back to sleep and the next day told my grandmother about seeing the family friend on the donkey being walked down the street last night. My grandmother figured she had to be dreaming and didn't think much more of it. Well later the day they find out that the old lady had died the night before in her sleep. I thought it was pretty creepy. I hope when I go out it ain't on a dang donkey. I've always been a bit of a skeptic when it comes to ghosts and the paranormal, but something happened to me a few years ago that I just can't explain. It was a typical night at the station, and I was working alongside the medics and firefighters. I had been using my radio in the ambulance earlier in the night, but when I went to grab it, I realized I had left it behind. So I walked out of the quarters and into the bay to retrieve it. As I was walking, a firefighter walked past me wearing bunker pants and a t-shirt. I didn't think anything of it at the time, assuming he was just heading out to grab something from his truck. But when I walked into the bay, I noticed that the quint was gone on a call. It was strange, but I figured maybe they had just left in a hurry and forgot to tell me. Feeling a bit spooked, I walked back inside to the shared quarters. But when I got there, it was completely empty. The kitchen was empty, the bathrooms were empty, and there was no sign of anyone else being there. I asked the fire guys about it the next morning, and they said that no one else would have been there at that time. It was just me and them. I couldn't explain what had happened, but it definitely left me feeling a bit unsettled. From that moment on, I couldn't help but wonder if there was something more to the world than what we can see and understand. My brother's best friend is blind. He has told me that he has experienced spirits since he was young, good and bad. The most memorable event that he told me was when he was lying in bed and suddenly felt like something was strangling him and that he could not move no matter how hard he tried. After that happened he went into his mom's room to retrieve a crucifix to hang on his wall. After hanging the crucifix on his wall he turned to walk away only to see it flying across the room and smashing on the opposite wall. This was not his first and will not be his last encounter with spirits. He has moved several times since this incident and says no matter where he goes it still occurs to this date. I had never believed in ghosts before my hunting trip to Three Rivers. It was a beautiful place, with lush greenery and rolling hills. The house we stayed in was cozy, but there was something eerie about it. On the first night, I lay down in bed, exhausted from the long day of hunting. The ceiling fan was on, gently blowing cool air over me as I drifted off to sleep. But then something strange happened. I heard the fan stop, and I sat up, confused. I thought maybe the power had gone out, but then I smelled it, 
the strong odor of sulfur. I felt dizzy, like I was drunk, and I stumbled out of bed, trying to figure out what was happening. As I stood up, I noticed that the light switch was off. I hadn't turned it off, so I was confused as to why it was off. And then I heard it, voices coming from the kitchen, along with the sound of the microwave beeping. I cautiously walked towards the kitchen, feeling the hair on the back of my neck standing up. The voices got louder and I could make out a woman's voice. It was then that I remembered that an old lady had died in this house two years before. I was terrified, but also fascinated. Could it be that her spirit was still lingering in the house? The thought sent shivers down my spine. For the rest of my stay, I felt like I was being watched, like there was always someone in the room with me. I didn't sleep much that night, too scared to close my eyes. And the next morning, I asked the other hunters if they had heard anything during the night. They looked at me with confusion, telling me that they had slept like babies and heard nothing. It was then that I realized that I had experienced something truly otherworldly. My parents built their house in 79 on a lot where a young couple died in a tornado in the early 1900s. When they were leveling the lot they found a lot of bricks from the destroyed house the couple lived in. They used the bricks for walkways, a patio, and such. I had the bedroom in the middle of the hallway. My parents decided to make me and my sister share the room at the end of the hall when we were little and make my bedroom into a playroom. The nightmares were horrible. I would see shadows of little people run past the door. There would be large shadowy figures standing in the middle of the room. The center of the room would get cold at night. After about three months I moved back into my old bedroom and everything went back to normal. When I left for college my sister took over my old room. I came home the summer of my first year and ended up in the room at the end of the hall. The nightmares and shadow sightings were worse than ever. After one week at home I started sleeping on the couch and spent the rest of the summer there. I haven't stayed in that room since. I never believed in ghosts, but my buddy's story made me think twice. He showed me a picture of his family at his grandmother's wake, and there was something strange in the background. The whole family had gathered around a fire pit outside the house, and they had taken a photo before everyone left. In the picture, there were around 15 to 29 people standing in front of the fire pit, and everything seemed normal. But when my buddy made copies of the photo to give to his family members, something strange happened. In one of the copies, there was smoke from the fire pit in the form of a person. I was skeptical at first, but when I saw the photo, I couldn't believe my eyes. It was a print from the middle of the copies, and the back of the photos were numbered from the print shop. There was no explanation for the ghostly figure in the photo. My buddy's family believed that it was the spirit of his grandmother, who had passed away just a few days before the wake. They thought that she was there with them, watching over them and saying goodbye in her own way. I don't know what to make of it, but I do know that I'm now a bit more open-minded about the paranormal. It's hard to explain what happened in that photo, but it's definitely made me think twice about what's out there beyond what we can see. When I was younger we were staying at Hunts Court Cottages in Rockport and they were on the same lot area that my papa used to live on as a child. We came back Tadhi Cottage after visiting with my great aunt, Papa sister who has a sixth sense, and went to bed. During the night my papa woke up and saw someone in the walk-in closet with the light on. He said, Verna, my mom also my great-grandmother's name, what are you doing in there? There was no response. My mom all woke up and looked and saw the same thing and said the again Verna what are you doing in there? Thinking my mom was in the closet. Then the figure was gone. At that moment my mom all looked at Pa Pa and said, I smell the perfume wind song, an old lady perfume, and my Pa Pa said, my mother used to wear that. The next morning my great aunt came over for coffee and breakfast and as soon as she walked through the door, she stopped dead in her tracks and says I smell windsong. 
The entire family was wide-eyed and silent. To this day my family feels it was my great-grandmother who was in the closet and actually was murdered in Rockport when my papa was in Korea. Strange for sure. It was the summer of 2005, and I had been living in a small town about two hours west of the city for a few years. My life was simple, and I spent most of my free time exploring the surrounding forests, hiking trails, and parks. I had befriended the local park ranger, a kind and knowledgeable man named Tom, who taught me about the area's flora and fauna, and shared my interest in the supernatural. One day, as I was driving through Love's Park on Riverside, I experienced something truly bizarre. Out of nowhere, something large and dark flew over my car, casting a shadow that momentarily blotted out the sun. As I squinted to catch a glimpse of what it could have been, I heard something say my name very loudly, as if it came from inside my car. I swerved in surprise, narrowly avoiding an accident, and pulled over to the side of the road. After catching my breath and calming my racing heart, I decided to keep this strange experience to myself, not wanting to be labeled a lunatic. Fast forward to the fall of 2009. I had moved into an apartment complex on the outskirts of town, nestled between a sprawling forest and a peaceful lake. One evening, I stepped outside for a cigarette and looked up at the sky, enjoying the crisp autumn air. Suddenly, a massive creature with an enormous wingspan flew over the building, barely 20 feet above the rooftop. It looked like a pterodactyl from a prehistoric era, and my mind raced back to that day in Love's Park. I stared in disbelief as the creature disappeared into the distance. The following day, I decided to confide in Tom, the park ranger, about my sightings. We met for a cup of coffee at a local diner, and I recounted my experiences in detail. To my surprise, Tom listened intently and didn't dismiss my story as the ramblings of a madman. Instead, he shared a theory that he had been secretly researching, that the creature I had seen was the infamous Chicago Mothman. Intrigued by the possibility, we spent the next few months poring over historical records, news articles, and eyewitness accounts of similar sightings in the area. As we dug deeper into the mystery, we uncovered a pattern of unusual occurrences and unexplained phenomena that stretched back decades. We even spoke to other witnesses who had encountered the creature and heard their harrowing stories. As the years went by, Tom and I continued our investigation into the Chicago Mothman, always searching for answers, and always just one step behind the elusive creature. Our quest became an obsession, a bond that connected us and fueled our curiosity. And though we never managed to capture definitive proof of the Mothman's existence, the memories of our encounters with the unknown still haunt us to this day. Every time I read a new story about the Chicago Mothman, I can't help but think back to that summer day in Love's Park and that autumn evening outside my apartment. And I wonder, will I ever come face to face with the creature again? Or will it forever remain a mystery, a dark shadow that flits across the sky and whispers my name from the depths of the unknown? I'm a ranger currently. And before this, I had another job at a different park. That will probably never step foot in. After what I experienced there last year. For the record, it's very busy. During the day, I got a lot of visitors. And did a lot of walkthroughs and tours. My favorite part about the job was, everybody left at night. I would have the park all to myself. I was the only one working that shift. I love nature. I'm the happiest when I'm outside, so this was the perfect job for me. One day, I had had this older lady come in and ask a tour. She was by far the nicest I'd met, and she seemed to enjoy my company for some reason. She stalled the tour as much as she could. Called me a child the entire time when seeing something or making a statement or a question. That seemed sweet to me. She was just so sincere. And to share my same passion was wonderful. She told me later, I realized we pretty much felt the same way about nature. And even had a very similar connection. 
I felt something warm about this lady that I could not really describe it, but I didn't mind spending the entire day showing her around. As it got darker, she was beginning to get sad, and I asked her about it. She told me that she was sad about her time with me passing, and I told her she can come here anytime if she wanted to and talk. She thanked me, said that she hopes that she will have a chance to come again. In her voice and eyes, I saw that somehow she believed she would never see me again after that night. It was overall sad, and I wondered if she had a disease or something and was dying, but I thought it rude to ask, so I didn't. She said she wanted to show me something and took me to the last part of the park. And there was this beautiful fountain. She told me how the fountain was made of marble. And it was probably the most beautiful fountain that will ever be built, because it was built by her grandfather and she loved very much. When she was a little girl, she would often come to the edge and look at the water, imagining what her life would end up like. But she never hoped it would turn out like it did. She was very calm and seemed like she was at peace with everything around her and inside of her. I couldn't believe somebody could be that peaceful. Although I told her I would be happy if she came around here more often, the sadness in her eyes remained. She took my face in her hands, told me she was proud of me. That it turned out just the way she could have hoped. That kind of confused me, but I didn't want to ask. She said it was time to say goodbye. I went behind the fountain. I followed her to see where she was going, but nobody was there. Now I was weirded out, I didn't know where this old lady had disappeared to. I asked the guy at the reception of an older lady with her description had left, and he said no. No older women had came in today at all. The whole thing was extremely weird, but I ignored it, went on with my day. Now, fast forward two months later. I was looking through my mom's photo album and I saw a picture of the old lady. I was shocked and asked my mother who that was. What she told me made me question my reality and my memory to this day. She said that she was my great grandmother. I still believe that something unexplainable happened to me. The next day I quit my job. If I ever saw that fountain again, I would ask about it. And I'm too afraid to find out if what that woman told me is true. I reside in this general area. About one year ago, I was driving through the town of Barrington Hills northwest of Chicago. As I drove east around maybe 6 630, it was dawn and light began to emerge from the east as sunrise. I proceeded east on 62 Palatine Road and saw some gigantic flying in the sky, almost staying and keeping up with the night that was departing. The creature definitely changed directions and appeared to be like a plane. I knew it wasn't because of how slow it seemed to go at times. I tried to get a picture with my cell but it was fruitless. Too far. But 100%, here is a creature aloft here or some party that has some 2023 flying suit platform that is huge. It was big enough for me to see and it was 5 plus miles away. Chasing the horizon west. Growing up, I always wanted to be like my father. Brave and courageous, always fighting against wrong and instilling good or trying to. He was a police officer, and from a very tender early age, I decided that was the path I was going to continue on to. Carrying a real weapon everywhere, you know the fantasy of beating up bad guys and robbers. Maybe it wasn't my father who had influenced me to be an officer. Maybe it was more the action movies we used to watch like Die Hard and things like that. Anyways, fast forward and I'm 22 years old, a newly appointed rookie officer. Patrol duty near Emily Bridge in Vermont, it was a very popular tourist attraction, but not because of its beauty, because of the creepy urban legend surrounding it. This 50-foot-long bridge is said to be the site of a young woman's self-harm in the mid-1800s. According to legend, the woman, Emily, was supposed to meet her lover at the bridge to elope. However, she ended up hanging herself from the rafters when he never showed. Now it's believed that Emily's ghost scratches at cars, it crosses pedestrians, and sometimes just appears in front of them in her ghastly evil form. 
I don't believe in such superstitions and legends, people have committed s in many places. How come the whole world is not haunted with their spirits? So it was a Saturday morning, the time of my duty right near the bridge. I was patrolling alongside my partner, a 39-year-old officer whose name I will not mention. 20 years of experience and a lot of stories on how he saved the world, apparently. He's so talkative, my head ached from listening to him over and over. I tried joining him off by playing Grease 2 in my head and eating my roll, which I bought street food. During patrolling is the best, my partner also had a roll, but God forbid he quietly eat and stop talking. He's narcissistic and so self-obsessed, he even talks with his mouth full. During one of his abnormally long stories about how he had apparently saved a woman from being kidnapped, we heard a shrill scream. It seemed that a woman was screaming, but what most shook me was the pure terror that could be heard in her voice. We quickly geared up a walk toward the sound of the scream, which was apparently under the Emily Bridge. As soon as we reached there, I saw a sight which I'll probably won't ever be able to forget. A man lying on the ground moaning in pain as his back bled and a pool of blood was forming underneath him, while a woman was being strangled by a white shimmery thing. When my partner and I both stopped, the white thing stopped strangling that woman and turned around. It was a ghost, the ghost of a woman, probably Emily from the legend. It stopped and disappeared, it gave us this creepy cackle and quickly disappearing. We stood shaken for a moment because what on earth? but then went towards the distressed couple lying traumatized. I checked if the man was lying on the ground while my partner checked on the quietly sobbing woman. Thankfully, the woman was not hurt, so I called my partner to help me pick up the man and quickly get away from under the bridge, lest that Emily ghost comes again. How would this be able to happen, even guns wouldn't affect a ghost. After coming away from the bridge, I laid the guy in the back seat of my car and took out my first aid kit, while my partner phoned an ambulance. The woman, poor her, she was traumatized, asking if her boyfriend would be alright. He was bleeding badly, and my partner tried to console her, but she just could not stop sobbing. It was a terrifying thing being attacked, I wouldn't blame her so much for crying. I would have done it too. We tried asking her what happened but she couldn't speak so much to tell what happened. When the ambulance arrived, we put the couple in it and sent them on their way to the hospital. We basically told our story to our supervisor, who laughed in our face and didn't believe me, even my experienced partner. At first, but we luckily had our cameras on us and had recorded the entire thing. Although the ghost of Emily was invisible in the recording, which is creepy, we could see the bleeding man and the being just flying in the air while clutching her neck where the hands of the ghost had been. Our supervisor was very quiet, asked us to do a follow-up with the couple and ask them about what happened there to make sure their stories added up. We waited till the next day before checking up on them. You obviously need some time to accept what happened and come out of that traumatized state. The next morning, we left for the hospital where the couple was currently in. We asked them how they had been and if they were feeling better. They were better physically, but emotionally they were still dealing with the repercussions of what happened. Upon asking what happened under the bridge, the woman told us that they were just making out when this being appeared. This white apparition formed around her boyfriend and tried to throw him off the bridge. He fought her back when she proceeded to attack, preventing him and her from leaving. I don't know when the woman tried to save her boyfriend by trying to drag him away and throw him off the bridge, this thing began choking this girl. It's completely wacko, right? While this thing was choking her is when we had appeared, as she profusely thanked us for saving their lives. Suggested that we should close the underside of the bridge. And safe to say, I did not expect this to happen when I applied for working as an officer. I understand this probably sounds like some cheesy creepy story, but I promise things happen on the job that are far more unquestionable than disturbing to say the least. And stories like this get concealed from the public far more often than you would ever imagine. Last summer, I decided to spend two weeks with my grandfather at his old house. He was always a fascinating character, 
full of stories and wisdom, and I looked forward to spending time with him. However, I also knew that he often claimed to see ghosts around the house, especially coming from the room I would be sleeping in. I tried to brush it off as just one of his eccentricities. One night, after an evening filled with my grandfather's captivating stories, I went to bed, feeling a bit uneasy. I couldn't shake off the feeling that something was off, but I attributed it to my overactive imagination. Eventually, I drifted into a light, restless sleep. As I lay there, half asleep, I suddenly felt a finger poke me hard in the arm, twice. The sensation was so real that I jolted awake, my heart pounding in my chest. I quickly scanned the room, expecting to find my grandfather playing a prank on me or something. But the room was empty, and my grandfather was snoring peacefully in his own bedroom down the hall. I tried to convince myself that it was just a dream or a muscle spasm, but the strange sensation in my arm persisted, making it impossible for me to dismiss what had just happened. I lay awake for the rest of the night, feeling scared and vulnerable, with every creak and groan of the old house making me jump. For the remainder of my stay, I couldn't shake off the fear that something supernatural was lurking in the house. Every time my grandfather casually mentioned seeing ghosts in the house, I felt a chill run down my spine. I tried to laugh it off, but the memory of that night haunted me. Eventually, my two weeks with my grandfather came to an end, and as much as I loved him and enjoyed our time together, I couldn't help but feel relieved to be leaving the house and its unsettling presence behind. Even now, when I think back to that summer, I can still feel the ghostly finger poking me in the arm, and I can't help but wonder if my grandfather's stories were more than just tales to entertain his grandchildren. Working at a hunting retreat in northern Canada was an experience I'll never forget. The solitude, the wilderness, and the sense of adventure made it an incredible place to be. I was the cook for the hunting lodge, and it was my job to prepare hearty meals for the hunters after a long day out in the wilderness. One early morning, I was walking from my cabin to the kitchen, ready to start my day. The air was crisp and cold, and a fresh blanket of snow had fallen overnight. It was so quiet that the only sound was the crunching of the snow beneath my boots. As I reached the kitchen, I realized I had left my apron behind in my cabin. Sighing, I turned back to retrieve it, trying to shake off the chill that had settled in my bones. That's when I saw them, large, unmistakable footprints in the snow, leading right up to the door. They were much bigger than any human footprints, and the stride was far longer than any person could take. My heart raced as I realized that something, or someone, had been following me as I walked to the kitchen. The thought of Bigfoot, a legend that had been passed around campfires for generations, crossed my mind. But that couldn't be possible, could it? I hurried back to my cabin, grabbing my apron and returning to the kitchen as quickly as possible. I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched, and I kept glancing nervously over my shoulder as I made my way through the snow. After that day, we all decided it was best to start doing things in pairs. The footprints had shaken us to our core, and we couldn't ignore the possibility that something was lurking in the wilderness around us. Even though we never saw any more signs of the mysterious creature, the memory of those footprints stayed with us, a chilling reminder that we were not alone out there. The legend of Bigfoot became a staple in our conversations, and we spent many nights huddled around the campfire, sharing stories and speculating about the creature that had left its mark on our lives. Though I still can't say for sure what it was that followed me that morning, the experience left me with a newfound respect for the untamed wilderness and the mysteries it holds. I sleep sitting partially up and I can see the door to the bedroom clearly. I awoke to a bright light under the door, originating in the hall beyond. The door opened and in walked several, I am not sure of the exact number, squat figures. They were silhouetted by a bright light in the hall. They were dark blue slash gray with large, blocky heads and virtually no neck. Their faces were heavily furrowed. 
They stood three to four feet tall and wore something that looked like monk robes that were very dark gray. When they entered the room, I became paralyzed. They stood around the bed, even on the other side where my wife was asleep. I tried to call out to her but I couldn't make a sound due to my paralysis. I sleep with a CPAP machine, mask and air hose, for sleep apnea. One of the figures removed the mask from my face. Another pulled the covers back off of me. They raised their arms and I floated up out of the bed, lying flat now. I floated above their heads toward the door. As I began to float out the doorway, I lost consciousness. The next thing I remember is floating above their heads back into the room toward the bed. I was angry, very angry, and with great effort, I began to thrash about a little. For some reason, they had difficulty controlling me through my anger. One of the figures on the far side of the bed next to my wife knocked something over on the dresser, but immediately righted it and put it back where it belonged. They regained control of me. They successfully floated me back into bed and pulled the covers back over me. They then retreated from the room. After they closed the door, the light went out and all was quiet. I regained my senses and found myself lying in bed without my CPAP mask on. I looked at the clock and it was 5.53 am. I got up out of bed, feeling both frightened and angry at the same time. I got up out of bed and started my day. In the morning my wife said that she had been up three times to go to the bathroom during the night which is unusual for her. She usually only gets up once and rarely remembers much about it. I searched the internet and was not able to find any pictures or drawings that resemble the figures. Then I bought a reference book and found an almost identical drawing. I was deer hunting behind my great grandmother's house, she was 103 at the time. I always got in my deer stand very early and would fall asleep with my cell phone in my hand with the alarm set on vibrate, for sunrise. Anyway, I was suddenly awoken and checked the time, two minutes before alarm would go off, then I looked into the field, which decades ago was my great grandmother's vegetable garden and at the far left corner saw a figure that looked to me like a little lady standing there with a garden hoe in her hand. It wasn't scary at all, very calming actually, even when it suddenly disappeared. I proceeded with the hunt and when I met my uncle in the woods to walk out he asked me if I had seen anything and I jokingly answered yeah I saw a ghost and he looked st me sideways but then we both laughed and started walking. As soon as we get out of the woods we notice that there are more people at Great Ma's house and as it turns out she had passed away at 6.12 that morning. My uncle and I have been so close this that day because he swears that I have a sixth sense. When I was in sixth grade, our class went on an outdoor education trip to a camp in the woods. I think the teachers and counselors really enjoyed scaring us kids while we were there. The pinnacle of our fright-filled experience was on a cold fall night when we all gathered around a giant bonfire. Our teacher had been telling campfire stories all night. Some were funny, some were scary, and some were just plain boring. We were starting to get worn out from all the stories when our teacher began to tell us about a mountain man who once roamed these very woods. According to the tale, this mountain man would walk through the forest at night, hunting game for various reasons. Rumor had it that you could still hear him walking through the woods to this day, all you had to do was listen closely to the sounds of the forest. Just as our teacher finished setting the scene, we suddenly saw a bright flash followed by an earth-shattering bang of a musket. Out of nowhere, this huge, wild-looking mountain man came barreling into our campsite, yelling and hollering at the top of his lungs. We all screamed in terror as he stormed through our midst, and then, just as suddenly as he appeared, he vanished into the darkness of the night. As if that experience wasn't terrifying enough, our teacher then decided to tell us one last story with almost no effort or care. He told us about a woman who had lost her child, who was about our age, in these very woods hundreds of years ago. It just so happened that tonight was the anniversary of the child's disappearance, 
and it had been reported that sometimes the ghostly figure of the woman could be seen peering into the cabins during our stay. My heart sank as I realized that my bed was positioned right next to a window in our cabin. As I lay there that night, I couldn't shake the fear that at any moment, I might see the ghostly woman searching for her lost child. Every creak, every rustle of leaves, every shadow seemed to suggest her presence just outside my window. Needless to say, I didn't sleep much that night or for the rest of our stay at the camp. While I knew deep down that the stories were probably just meant to scare us, I couldn't help but feel a lingering sense of unease, wondering if maybe, just maybe, there was a kernel of truth to the tales we had heard around that campfire. When I was in high school, my friends and I would occasionally drive out into the desert outside of Phoenix to a secluded area known to locals as the ravine. Essentially, the ravine was a massive man-made hole with perfectly flat walls running down all four sides, so deep into the ground that it was hard to see the bottom. The walls had no ledges, making it nearly impossible to climb in or out of. Picture a giant square-shaped well in the middle of the desert. One moonlit night, we were all gathered around the hole, drinking and partying, as we tended to do from time to time. We were tossing rocks and beer cans down the ravine when suddenly, we all heard something strange. It sounded like it was coming from somewhere deep in the bottom of the hole. Our flashlight provided little help, as it was just too deep to see all the way to the bottom. I immediately assumed it was a bird or, possibly, some other animal that had fallen in, but I wasn't sure. Suddenly, we heard whatever this thing was coming up the other side. But how? There is no way a bear or a deer or a bobcat or any four-legged animal could climb that thing unless it was a spider. That's the thing. We saw it. We saw it. The best way to describe it, you know the black Spider-Man? The evil Spider-Man? The one in the black? That's what it looked like. It looked like a human. Whatever it was, it had arms and it had legs. And it ran in a diagonal motion, in a zigzag motion, and it ran up. It shifted to the side and zigzagged back and ran up again. I swear to God, I have no idea what it was. It definitely wasn't a person. I can tell you that. There's no way a bear or any other animal could get up that unless it had wings. Okay, there's nothing to grab onto. I know it was real. I saw it. As it crawled up, rocks and sand were falling. It made noises. The actual thing didn't make noises, but rocks and the sand that fell made noises. We freaked out. The thing zigzagged out, and when it got to the top, it took off, and we couldn't see it anymore. We just looked at each other and said, it's time to go. Let's go. And we all took off. I don't know what it was. I don't have a clue, but it was weird. When I was 11, I was friends with this girl who lived alone with her mom in this massive old Victorian house. It was gorgeous, wood floors, fireplaces in every room, and heavy doors with window things at the top. She had told me her house was super haunted, but I figured she only thought that because of how old it was. So we're playing Barbies in her room. It's just her, one other girl, and me. Her mom is across the house sewing. They decide to go into the kitchen and make macaroni and cheese. I want to keep playing, so I stayed alone in her room. I watched them leave the room, and since the door was super heavy, I clearly heard it shut. The floors creaked as they walked into the kitchen. I could faintly hear them talking because the window thing was open above the door. To set the scene, I'm sitting on the floor with my back to the fireplace, doing my Barbie thing. On her mantle, she has like a dozen or so American Girl dolls lined up all perfect. About 10 minutes go by. I was still playing when I heard the door open. They were back from the kitchen. The girl who lives there immediately lays into me saying, that's not funny. You know I'm freaked out about the house and ghosts. I have no idea what they're talking about. Then I looked at the mantle. Every single one of the doll's arms were in the air. They refused to believe I didn't do it, and I still get goosebumps thinking about it. I 
I grew up in rural Pennsylvania and have spent most of my life here. I've been hiking all over the state at least once a week every week since I began driving at 16. But all across the many state parks, I have spent thousands of hours hiking in the woods. I've had three strange encounters now since the summer of 2022, almost as if a door has been opened since the first one. The story I'm sharing today is the most recent thing that happened to me and my two buddies last Saturday night. It completely traumatized me. My two lifelong friends and I went on a spur of the moment night hike Saturday night. I haven't hiked at night for nearly two years I used to hike alone all the time, but hiking with these two guys made us all feel bold. We were hiking near the part of the Appalachian Trail where we grew up in Duncanon and the at runs through the town. There's a ridge next to the town with a very popular hiking vista called Hawk Rock. At the base of the mountain, There's a creek that flows into the Susquehanna River and a road that follows this creek back into the woods for about a mile and a half. It leads to Boy Scout camp shelters and water wells, follows the creek around a bend, and then ends where the road ends. We have a low-key camping site that follows an easy-to-miss trail that continues past the road and goes into the woods another couple hundred of yards. We're about two and a half miles from the car. We're sitting there talking about Sasquatch and encounters. Both of my friends have ever had an encounter. This night was totally dark, with no moon. We couldn't see each other side by side without a flashlight and it was dead quiet. In hindsight, it seems weird. There are normally lots of frogs along that creek. I've been at this campsite about two dozen times and never had anything happen to us there. We're talking about missing 411 and my two previous encounters. One friend has never heard the Sierra sounds and my other friend told me not to play them. I made two tree knocks then we played the Sierra sounds in total darkness. On cue, not even a minute went by, and a huge rock splashed into the creek about 30 yards away from the direction of our trail and the only way out. I was already on my feet. I've thrown many rocks into creeks, rivers, and lakes and that rock was large. It made that whoop sound of breaking the water and crashing into the creek bed. Immediately, we felt that sense of dread and danger. Then it happened a second and a third time, back to back. I said we need to get the F out of here right now. We were 100% sober. I've been up and down that creek by kayak, trail, and fishing. It's one of the few areas in Pennsylvania that doesn't have beavers. I've never seen a beaver or signs of beavers anywhere along that creek. I've heard beaver tail slaps, and it didn't sound like that at all. It was loud and scared the crap out of us. It was so close to us that it didn't seem like just a coincidence. We packed our bags up at hammocks in less than a minute and started walking out in the direction of these splashes. We got parallel to where it happened, maybe 30 seconds later. The creek was 5 feet to our left. There was a fog over the creek. We couldn't see the other side but there was nothing over there but woods. Then it happened a fourth, a fifth, and a sixth time. Loud splashes of large rocks crashed into the water right next to us. I was on point. We're going through this trail with the brush to our right and the creek to our left dark. We weren't speaking to each other. We stuck together and were only focused on getting out. We got back to the road and we were practically jogging back toward the car. We were saying that was weird and was too close and too conveniently timed. We continued down this road and got a mile away from where it happened. The road was maybe 50 feet from the creek now and a little bit higher up, but still parallel to the creek and completely silent. So quiet that you could hear a pin drop. We began to feel like we were okay now. But then it happened again. A large loud splash in the creek below is perfectly parallel to us. The sense of danger was palpable and we could feel it around us. Something was on the other side of the creek mirroring us. The problem was there are no trails, no houses, nothing but woods over there. Whatever it was over there was keeping pace with us silently without light or without a trail and we could feel it. We got to the end of the road and two kids were walking in with lights. We saw them coming. I said to my friends we have to tell them what just happened. We couldn't let these kids go in there without warning. 
We told them what happened and all of us were clearly shaken and rattled. We got into the car and drove back to my buddy's place in town. For three hours we tried to rationalize and reason what it was. You couldn't think of any animal that checks all the boxes of the behavior. If it was somebody messing with us they were in the middle of nowhere without a light throwing large rocks and moving silently without a trail. If it was an animal we would have heard it moving. If it was something in the water we would have heard it displacing water while moving. I know this area like the back of my hand. I'm terrified to go back outside again and afraid as soon as the sun goes down. We all felt like we were lucky to get out of there. I was excited about spring and summer and to get back out hiking again, but I am terrified at the thought of it. When my grandmother passed away, a wall clock she had owned and loved very much, that by the time she passed away was in my family's possession, started ringing, probably about 20-30 times. It hadn't worked for about three years. Me, my brother and our mom was pretty creeped out, until dad called from the hospital a short while later and told us that my grandmother had passed away just shortly before the incident. Both creepy and kinda beautiful in a way, since me and my brother had been her two favorite grandchildren and I suppose that was her way of saying her last farewell. My name is Ali and I'm from Birmingham, UK. It was April 2017 and it had been raining pretty heavily for a few days so there hadn't been any children playing outside. However, on my way back home from work, it must have been around 6.30 or 7 p.m. I saw two children playing in the rain. I thought nothing of it since I did it as a child. It always rains in the UK so we just learn to adjust to it sometimes. A few hours later, I was leaving my house to go to the gym as I do most evenings and these two kids are still playing in the exact same spot. I thought maybe their parents told them to not move too far away from the house which made sense. So I just carried on my way. I was returning home from the gym and it was now 9.35 pm exactly and these kids were still there. Only this time they acknowledged that I had seen them and the younger of the two approached me and simply asked if I would let them in because it was raining and their parents weren't home. I was going to let them in until I saw their eyes. They were completely black. The entire eye, black as coal. The brother began to approach. It looked as though he was older. The younger sibling was defiant and definitely in charge. She asked again, this time with more anger in her tone just let us in. I stood frozen in fear, so I said, let me get you some help and then I turned away and sprinted to my house, locked the door, and ran to the window upstairs. I could see the kids still there. Now, this is where it gets weird. I took out my phone and thought, let me take a snapchat of this and warn others. As soon as I took the picture, they both looked up into the window like they knew what I was doing in my phone which was 65% battery at the time, just died. I plugged the charger in and nothing. It wouldn't even turn on. It's just dead. I looked back out the window and the kids were gone. The next day I went knocking on the doors of my neighbors and none of them had children except one couple who had one child but is only six months old. I definitely believe I had an encounter with something else. A few months ago, I experienced something that still sends shivers down my spine. It was just an ordinary night, and I had drifted off to sleep after a long day at work. I was snuggled comfortably under the blankets, enjoying a peaceful slumber. Suddenly, I woke up with a start, as if something had jolted me awake. My heart was racing, and I blinked a few times, trying to adjust to the darkness that enveloped the room. That's when I saw it the outline of a person standing right next to my bed. In the dim light, I couldn't make out any features, but I assumed it was my boyfriend, who must have come home late from work. I let out a nervous laugh, trying to shake off the fear that had gripped me. Oh my god, you scared me, I said, relief washing over me as I realized it was just him. He climbed into bed, and I reached out my arms, eager for the comforting embrace of his hug. 
But instead of feeling the warmth of his body, my arms found nothing but air. My heart skipped a beat, and panic set in. I fumbled for the bedside lamp, quickly turning it on to illuminate the room. My eyes darted around, searching for any sign of my boyfriend, but the room was empty. The realization that I had just seen an apparition hit me like a ton of bricks. My breathing became labored, and I felt a cold sweat forming on my brow. I couldn't bring myself to turn off the light or close my eyes, fearing that the figure would reappear. For the rest of the night, I lay awake, clutching the blankets tightly around me, jumping at every little sound. When morning finally came, I hesitantly shared my experience with my boyfriend, who tried to comfort me, suggesting that it was just a vivid dream or my imagination playing tricks on me. But I knew what I had seen and felt, the terrifying presence of something that couldn't be explained. Since that night, I've never been able to shake off the lingering fear that the mysterious figure will return. Every time I go to bed, I can't help but remember the chilling moment when I reached out for a comforting embrace, only to find nothing but emptiness. When I lived at my parents' house my mom would come into my room every night and kiss me goodnight, clear up until I moved out. When I was 17 I had pushed my bed into the corner of my room, parallel to the door. I got into bed and was trying to sleep but I couldn't for some reason. I was tossing and turning. Finally I got comfortable and was laying there with my back to the door and I start hearing carpeted footsteps coming down the hallway. I turn and glance at the clock and it's 11.45 PM and I'm thinking why is she coming so late? I turn back and decide that I'm going to pretend to be asleep because I'm tired and want to go to bed. I hear her footsteps come into my room and then walk across my room and stop at my bed. She leans her hands on my bed and my bed kind of creaks and my body tilts a little. I hear her lean over me because my ear sounds like there's something in front of it. That kind of muffled feeling when there's something close to your ear. And she just sits there. And I'm like, WTF? What is she doing? This is so annoying. So I quickly turn around and say can I help you? And I choked on the you because there was no one there. My stomach just dropped and chills ran over my whole body. I sat up and backed myself into the corner of the bed and just sat there shaking. I couldn't move. I ended up calling my boyfriend crying because I was so scared. I had something highly strange occur in 2015, another incident in a lifetime of inexplicable experiences, and I would appreciate any thoughts that you might share with me concerning this event. I read the obits in my local newspaper occasionally, as I sometimes worry that one of my old friend's parents or someone I have known has passed on and I would want to express condolences. My own parents died suddenly, very close together and I know how important that expressions of sympathy can be. This concerns an obit that I read last summer, I noticed it because the woman was a prominent lady who was a high school friend of my mother's, and also the mother-in-law of my son's cousin. She had died of cancer, and it was doubly sad because her granddaughter was going to be the queen of our local Rose Festival the following October. This is a great honor in our city, and the woman herself had actually been a Rose Queen in 1955. Her granddaughter is the daughter of my son's cousin James, so my son and I discussed the news at length. He was getting married in November of that year and was inviting members of that family to his wedding. So I actually shared the news of her death with a few people, and remember that well. Imagine my surprise when I read the local obits in June 2017 and saw that she had died recently. The story of her death was prominently featured, and I read it, in disbelief and utter shock, again and again. I called my son and he was confused as well, as I had already reported her passing to him two years previous. What can this mean? Did I have visual precognition of her death, two years before it occurred? Did I experience a time slip, going into the future to read her obit? Or did time curve back on itself and confuse me with a double death? This event has truly been worrisome to me, am I losing my mind and memory? The week before Memorial Day in 2017, 
I had the random thought that a distant great aunt of mine had passed and called several relatives to inquire about it. No, she was not dead, but no one knew anything about her situation if she had been ill? Was living with her daughter? She was 92, but eight days later L got the news that she had actually died six days after my phone calls. What are your thoughts? During high school, my boyfriend and I decided to sneak out one night and head to the lake. It was a secluded spot, and we thought it would be the perfect place to spend some time together, away from the prying eyes of our parents. The night was pitch black, and the only light came from the faint glimmer of the moon reflecting off the water. We found a park bench next to the shore and started making out. As we got more and more into it, I suddenly heard a strange sound coming from the water. I told my boyfriend to stop and listen, and we both went completely silent. The sound was like someone or something swimming methodically, as if they were trying to sneak up on us without being detected. The mysterious swimmer got closer and closer, and my heart started pounding in my chest. I could barely see anything in the darkness, but I could still hear the splashing and feel the tension in the air. It felt like whatever was in the water was about to reach out and touch us. Unable to take it any longer, I let out a scream, and we both jumped up from the bench and ran as fast as we could away from the lake. We didn't stop running until we were sure we were far enough away from whatever had been lurking in the water. To this day, I still have no idea what was in the lake that night. Was it a person trying to scare us? Or was it something else entirely? Whatever it was, the memory of that night still sends shivers down my spine whenever I think about it. That experience taught me a valuable lesson. Sometimes, the scariest things can happen in the most unexpected places, and the unknown can be more terrifying than anything else. I have a buddy named Corey, childhood best friend and next door neighbor. In the summer before 10th grade we had a sleepover at our mutual friend Mark's house. Mark's mom was super chill and always hung out with us. One night she brings over a Ouija board and suggests we play with it. No big deal. Being the music fans we are we ask it stupid shit. Let me speak to the spirit of Jimi Hendrix, Bob Marley, etc. The planchette was moving and we all swore it wasn't us doing it purposefully. At one point, Mark asks it to prove it's real, always a bad decision. From under Mark's bed, 20 pounds free weight slid across the floor and hit an adjacent wall. Freaked out, we stopped for the night. Throughout the next few weeks we would go to Mark's house, sleep over, do the Ouija board. We decide to set up some basic recording equipment, ask questions, and play the recording back to try and hear things. We did get some faint noises, I'm not convinced it was anything but Mark was, and so Mark got creeped out and gave the board to Corey. Now that Corey had it, him, myself, and his GF at the time Katie used it much more frequently. We were at till asking stupid questions and getting dumb answers. After about three months of this, all of that changed. The Ouija board started responding oddly. We would ask, what's my mom making for dinner? and the board would spell out the rotting corpses in your walls. It would start to try and touch the four corners, make the infinity symbol, and go through the alphabet backwards, all bad signs. Corey became obsessed with it. He started doing the Ouija board alone, which is also a bad idea. While using it, he would ask it to do things and it would, stand up on its tip, climb a wall, shoot out from under our hand. The planchette started feeling heavy and would leave drag marks on the board. I got creeped out. I told Corey we should stop. He didn't. Corey, still very interested in things like this decided to try automatic writing, whereby you ask the spirit to use your own motor skills to move a pen and write on paper. Corey, who is left-handed, grabbed the pen with his right hand slightly contorted, starting writing shakily. First the alphabet then words. Unfortunately I don't remember exactly what he wronged but it was scary to see. Corey started acting weird after that. 
We were in chorus in HS and while singing his right hand would move around and practice writing on the sheet music. I remember on day he wrote, Josh wants Katie. Don't let him get her. He would start jabbing me with his pencil when we were next to each other and other weird behaviors. Being both raised Roman Catholic, we were a part of a local youth group that prayed the rosary every Monday night. Corey's dad would drop us off, mine would pick us up. One night in November it was raining and my dad came to pick us up at about 9.30 p.m. Corey decided to decline the ride and said he would get a ride with someone else. Okay? Weird. But whatever. He calls me close to midnight that night and says he blacked out during the prayer meeting and came to while standing on the bridge near our home in the pouring rain staring at the water below. For context, we live in Riso in November, it's cold especially at night, especially when it's rainy. At that point I urged him to get rid of it. After I started trying to get Corey to get rid of it, I started being attacked. I would get woken up in the middle of the night after feeling like someone flicked or tapped me on the forehead. I would get woken up and be half off my bed like I was dragged out. I would wake up and see all my blankets folded on my bureau across the room, I am a very light sleeper. I called Corey and told him I was going to get rid of it myself. He gave me the board that afternoon. The night before I got rid of it, as I was sleeping I was jolted away. It had felt like something grabbed my arm. The hand felt bony, cold, and like it had very long fingers. I stayed up the rest of the night sitting on my bed, all the lights on, scared shitless. The next day, based on info I found online, I cut the board up into seven pieces and buried them separately in a nearby old historical cemetery. I ended up having a bruise on my forearm for the next two weeks. I haven't had any related instances since. Corey probably has additional info he could add to this as well but this is all I got. He has mentioned having really messed up dreams and he had other experiences at this time, but I don't know enough to tell them. An old friend of mine and I planned a trip to Isle Royal in 2008. We have been on a couple of adventures together. Boundary Waters, Appalachian Trail, so this was just another awesome week to get away and enjoy the outdoors. Which we did end up doing, but man did we have one hell of a time. On the third night, I was out going to the bathroom when I thought I heard something move a few yards away. I stopped for a moment and almost went to investigate but decided that it was nothing and headed back to camp. That next morning we packed up camp and while getting ready my buddy, David, called me over to him. He was right outside our campground, and he pointed out two sets of wolf tracks. I about shit myself realizing what that noise was the night before. So we finished packing our bags and kept hiking. Neither David or I would wander more than 10 yards away from one another from that point on. The last night we were getting our bags set in a tree so the bears and mini bears wouldn't get to them. When all of a sudden my friend said he saw something move. I looked and didn't see a thing, but I didn't question him. We grabbed our flashlight stoked the fire. Neither of us slept that night, I didn't see anything or for that matter hear anything that night. Once the sun came up, We got our packs down and cleaned up our campsite. When we were about to leave David went and checked the place he thought he saw something. Sure enough man, this dude found another set of tracks. I finished packing my shit, we got to the docks, and I looked at him and said, never again. To this day neither of us have gone camping. Growing up in Montana, I was no stranger to the wild beauty of nature, but one particular incident still stands out as the most thrilling and terrifying experience of my life. One summer day, three of my friends and I decided to go for a hike on some private property on the outskirts of the city. We were all eager to spend time in the great outdoors, and nothing could have prepared us for what we were about to witness. As we trekked through the woods, we suddenly heard a commotion coming from the steep tree line nearby. We saw a deer sprinting down the slope as if its life depended on it, and that's when we saw it, a massive sasquatch emerged from the woods and pounced on the deer. The deer tripped, 
and they both landed just about 15 feet away from us. We were all stunned, our hearts racing with a mixture of fear and adrenaline. Without any hesitation, we ran down the hill, trying to put as much distance between us and the scene as possible. We waited, hidden behind some trees and bushes, watching the area where the Sasquatch had disappeared with the deer. After what felt like an eternity, the creature emerged from the tree line, dragging the deer by its leg. We watched in awe as it vanished back into the woods, taking its prey with it. The encounter left me with an uneasy feeling, and for over a year, I couldn't bring myself to venture into the woods at night. Despite the fear that it instilled in me, I can't deny that it was the most incredible thing I have ever seen. I'll never forget the day that I came face to face with a Sasquatch, a legend that had suddenly become a reality right before my eyes. My Nana's house has a bit of a sad history. The house was built on a plot of land as a dream home for a newly wed and pregnant couple. Shortly before move-in day the wife was shot and killed while getting off a bus downtown. The husband, in his grief shortly after killed himself. The house then went to market and my papa bought it for Nana. They were also newly weds. As time went by, weird things started happening in the house. Little things like lighters would go missing, or the remote which was on the coffee table would be found under the couch where you could hear the pool balls from the pool table crack even though they were in their case. This freaked my papa out, but Nana was much harder to scare. Every now and then you'd see scratch marks on the cathedral ceilings only to hire a painter and they are gone the day he would show up, this happened on four occasions. Still, Nana was not scared. Shortly after, Papa had an accident and he passed, this left Nana alone in the house. Years pass, and in my teens I move from my country and in with Nana. I'm walking to the kitchen one day and I hear Nana talking, she is saying don't you touch them again, you old witch. I pop into the kitchen and ask Nana who she is talking to. Mabel she replies. I assume Mabel is one of the cats she's rescued and carry on. Every now and then, I hear Nana talking to Mabel, it's usually don't you touch this, or would you stop that playing with the lights, knocking over a fan, it never occurs to me to address it. Till one night, I have this horrific dream about a woman being shot. I wake up terrified and I see almost like a dark shadow fading from the foot of the bed. I'm completely freaked out, but just think it's my eyes adjusting after being bolted awake. The following morning I tell Nana about my dream over breakfast. Oh, that's just Mabel, she'll come to you from time to time, I was wondering when she was going to show herself to you she says. I'm taken aback, and Nana tells me the Mabel story and how Mabel was the wife. I ask Nana is that who she's been talking to and she confirms it is. As time goes on, little things start to go missing as usual, and I'm creeped out at first, but make a game out of it by hiding things and moving glasses when family is around and saying, oh Mabel Nana's cigarettes go missing, must have been Mabel. Mabel one night on Christmas Eve decided to walk up the stairs and her footsteps got a little too close for comfort and I shouted stop it Mabel, you're scaring me and they stopped. Fast forward again and I've moved out of the house, Nana has passed away and me and my sister are tasked with going through her things. No one has been in the house for months, the power has been turned off and me and my sister enter the home after sundown. Once we're on the front landing, from the landing you can see the downstairs to the left of us and upstairs to the top landing, standing in the entryway something just didn't feel right. We go upstairs and start to collect some things, I'm going through Nana's china and my sister walks into the dining room and says tell me you heard that? What? Tell me you hear that baby crying? I stop. Listen. And I do. It's very faint and it's coming from the basement. I ask my sister if the TV in one of the basement bedrooms could be on, she reminds me the power is cut. I ask if it's a neighbor, but we live a quarter mile from anyone. We walk to the living room and I lean over the landing and sure as hell there is a baby crying. I tell my sister to call the police and I go down slowly to the second landing. My sister exits the house. From the second landing I slowly proceed towards the basement, 
Fearing a crackhead or something may have broken into the empty house and made this place their home. When I get to the bottom of the steps, what I felt can only be described as what you feel when a car is close to you with an incredibly loud bass system, where you feel and hear the sound and your hair stands on end. Except now the baby crying has turned into an all-out, banshee scream, as if someone was in anguishing pain. I turned and ran up the stairs slamming into my sister on my way out the front door, and we both book it as fast as we can to the car. I'm shaking and my sister is panicking, she heard and felt it from the front porch. We throw the car in reverse and reverse all the way down Nana's driveway, eyes on the front door almost expecting someone to run out. But no one does. Two officers arrive and we explain what happens, they enter the house and find nothing. No signs of forced entry and nothing disturbed. To this day I'm convinced it was Mabel. When I was younger I used to go to work with my parents at a newspaper company. My best friends at the time and was super religious guy and my older sister. I was around 7 at the time. As kids we loved to explore everything which included the cemetery right next to the factory. One day we were gonna go when my sister needed to use the bathroom. At the time my older sister was a bit of a tomboy and despised the color pink. She went into the hallway which had the bathrooms while my friend and I waited outside for her. When she came out two minutes later she was completely changed with pink clothes and glasses. I found this odd but I brushed it off. When I asked if we were ready she got defensive but said yes which also struck me as odd. My sister was not the aggressive type. When I go to pat her on the shoulder she immediately moves out of the way. She then says that she forgot something in the bathroom and runs back into the hallway. I shit you not, not even 10 seconds later my sister comes back out wearing what she had on when she went in the first time. My friend and I asked her why she changed again and she looked at us confused and though we were joking. Obviously scared as shit my friend and I ran and didn't go exploring that day. We didn't even go near that bathroom. Fast forward about 13 years and I'm 20 already. I've thought that the whole thing was a fever dream I had and my sister randomly brings it up. She tells me her side which was basically that she went into the bathroom and she felt like she had eyes on her the whole time then when she came out she saw something dart into the men's bathroom. Had a Great Dane, about 2 years old and 150 pounds. Walking in North Hampshire with him on an 8 feet lead but just letting it drag as he walked in front of me. Dog turns the bend before me by about 10 feet and immediately posted up, like he saw something. Figured it was a deer and started calling him back. Nope he takes off. I run around the corner to see him chasing a 200 pound, I'm guessing, black bear. Not huge but big enough. Dog thinks he found his long lost friend and new playmate, Bear thinks he's under attack. As he chases the bear, the bear turns and posts up on him. Again Dog thinks he's playing so he's does the front paw dance. This happens twice, all while I'm screaming my freaking head off, to the point I bursted a blood vessel in my eye, trying to call him back so he doesn't get killed. Finally he realized I'm pissed and starts running back to me. Well as he does the now fully pissed off bear gives chase. Dog comes right to me and sits next to me. I stand there in shorts and an under armor shirt without so much as a stick. Charging bear. I'm thinking it's me or my dog and I'll kill for my dog. I stand in front of him waving my arm screaming as deeply and loudly as I possibly could. Bear comes within 15 feet at full speed lunges to a tree and climbs up about 20 feet, perches and makes this hissing growl like nothing I've ever heard. I tell the dog truck. Now. He heads back down the trail while I slowly walk backwards still screaming and waving my arms, trying not to shit my pants. I round the corner and lose sight of the bear but could hear his claws descend the tree and could hear him faintly in the woods. Never been so scared in my life. Now I never go hiking without bear spray and a .45 and always hold the leash now. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories.
We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.